The ending of a story is never an easy accomplishment. Especially when that ending came about from the story being forcibly gutted, causing the creators to scramble for a new ending, while also satisfying as many character threads and plotlines as they could, even at the expense of any potential plot threads and character arcs that might have felt more natural if left alone, all in the span of just three episodes. Three episodes! How the hell did they expect anyone to do all that in just three Frickin' episodes! Disney, you absolute, dunderheaded, art-hating, spirit-breaking, company-destroying, brainless bunches of fu- <sighs> No, no. I don't want the video to start out on this note. Let's start over. We've lost a lot of things. Oh, no, no, too far. There we go. If you're a big fan of the Owl House, then you're probably well aware of the unfortunate circumstances that led to its third and final season being drastically shorter than the previous two. But for the sake of those who are just joining us, Sometime before season one had even finished, some executive butt goblin at Disney TV informed showrunner slash creator Dana Terrace that the Owl House was going to be cut short due to not fitting the almighty brand that companies like Disney cherish so much. And after a bit of self-reported haggling on Terrace's part, Wait a minute. Oh, oh, we're supposed to haggle. The third and final season would now consist of three specials that would serve to wrap up the show in about a third of the time a proper season would get. We will cut the bike down the middle and give half to each of you. What? This is your solution? To ruin the bike? Of course, I don't have all the information as to how exactly this impacted production of the series, as they were knee-deep into season two by the time Dana Terrace got this unfortunate news. Although, from what I've been able to gather, much of the second half of the second season was reorganized in a mad attempt to build towards this new, shortened conclusion. Condensing certain plot twists and scrapping a few character revelations altogether. Hashtag hootie hole theory. This would also bring about the wild card edition of The Collector. Wild card, bitches! Yeah! What? An enigmatic interdimensional being who helped the main antagonist accomplish his dirty deeds. And whose inclusion I felt was a little rushed before I knew this full context. But that's what YouTube comments are for. So, so many YouTube comments. Actually, the reason why The Collector wasn't foreshadowed in Season 1 or the early episodes of Season 2 is because they actually weren't even going to be in the show. The reason Dana added him was because she had always wanted to add a character like The Collector into the I show. I should note about you stating that The Collector's edition seemed sudden. The Collector was a late idea that was not a decided on plot point by the time Season 1 ended. So no, there was no foreshadowing in that According season. to Dana, the collector was only added after they got cut of a third season, so that might be part of why their inclusion felt The sudden. thing about the collector is that not even the crew didn't thought he'll be included in the end. The idea of the collector started in episode one when Tiny Nose said something like, We are toys for a higher being. So, after the cancellation of season three, Dana and the crew were like, well, we have nothing else to lose, we the might as well- The collector couldn't be foreshadowed in season one, I think. From what I've heard, I think in an interview with Dana Terrace, the collector was not planned until the short- 2.59.36, I would like to point out that this is completely wrong, seeing as the collector was shoved into season two after they were cut short, lol. So the reason the collector feels sudden is because he is sudden. Dana says she always wanted to have a godlike character like the Collector, so when the crew found out the Owl House got shortened, they decided to- oh, I get it! With all the game-changing twists and shakeups introduced during the last few episodes of Season 2, and only three 48-plus minute specials to wrap everything up in a neat little package, there were many who questioned whether the Owl crew would really be up to the challenge. Hell, to seemingly condense 20 episodes worth of story into the relative runtime of a Disney Channel movie, It's hard to imagine anyone who could pull it off in their shoes. Nevertheless, the Owl crew carried on, 
encouraging fans not to give up hope even when their efforts to knock some sense into Disney's heads proved fruitless. And by the time the first special premiered in October of last year, oh god, please tell me it's still last year by the time I release this. Nope. Fans were ready to reluctantly accept the show's all too sudden conclusion, released across the span of six months. And did they manage to do it? Did the Owl crew pull off the impossible and bring us an ending worthy of such a beloved show in the hearts of many? An ending that could fulfill every burning question and every helpless desire the fandom had for months, if not years? Well, no, of course not. I mean, in a literal sense, no ending is ever gonna be perfect and satisfy everyone. Hell, I just made a whole other video about Amphibia's third season where that was the central thesis. And by just, I mean like nearly a year ago at this point. Look, I mostly make videos by myself, alright? But considering the nigh-impossible circumstances that led to it, I'd say the Owl crew still gave us the best damn ending anyone possibly could. By the way, this video assumes you're familiar with what happened in Season 2, but just in case you need a refresher, here's a really quick summation. Whoa. Her? There's no place like... I wanna be a witch! I thought you were going to sing about growing up in Connecticut! <laughs> Exactly like you. Strange things are afoot at the Circle K. It's been Agatha all along. Can I offer you a nice egg in this trying time? Yeah. A solar eclipse. The cosmic ballet goes on. No, 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 no! It's too late! We're banished, genius! We're in the human world! Everybody got that? Good! Season 3 sees our cast separated by the horrific events that took place during the Day of Unity, Emperor Bellos' diabolical plan to wipe out all the witches and demons of the Boiling Isles through the use of a draining spell. Stopped at the last minute by Bellos' former colleague, the Collector, the Owl Weirdos find themselves on different sides of the portal between the human and demon realms, with Luce, Amity, Gus, Willow, and Hunter on one side, and King, Ida, Lilith, Hootie, and all the rest of their friends and loved ones on the other. After Luce and the others fill her mom in on all that's happened, Camila takes them all in as they recuperate and try to figure out a way back to their home before the Collector can do too much damage. But as the months go on, and the young witches become more and more homesick, Luce carries an immense guilt over her inadvertent part in Bellus's genocidal machinations and Hunter gets a growing sense of dread that they may not be rid of the Inquisitous Emperor just yet. Truth be told, the biggest concern I had for Season 3 wasn't whether or not the quality would remain consistent with what had come before. It was mainly how the heck I was gonna cover it for how frickin' short it was gonna be. Typically in these last few videos I've done for Owl House or even Amphibia, there's been enough material for me to work with where I could talk about different themes and character arcs in a somewhat scattershot order, and I could probably do the same for these three specials. But so much happens in each of them that trying to dissect everything by themes or character arcs like I normally do would probably wind up being an incomprehensible mess to anyone who hadn't seen the show. The inverse problem, however, would be that if I were to break down each special plot beat for plot beat, that would end up making the video feel completely superfluous to anyone who had a seen the show, a worry I often have when I end up recapping stuff in this manner. Not to mention the pain in the ass that is YouTube's copyright claim system. I know, I know, most of you didn't click on an Owl House Season 3 vid to hear some guy talk about his YouTubing process or whatever. But I think for the sake of both parties, the best way to go forward is to talk about each episode individually, and try to dissect the most important themes and character moments as they relate to what we've seen in prior seasons, and how these elements build upon each other with each episode towards the finale. <laughs> how novel, right? Pasty White Guy discovers basic reviewing techniques, Spore 11. I'm gonna try and be as concise as I can, and still keep this video open enough to anyone who may not have seen the show yet. Seriously, my person, thanks for watching, but 
why are you here? To be frank though, as I've recently rewatched the entire show in preparation for this video, I've got a lot of notes and a lot of musings that may or may not make sense even to people who have seen the whole thing multiple times. <clears throat> Shall we? The first thing I'll address as a sort of icebreaker is the completely different vibe Thanks to Them has compared to the rest of the show. That's a given, considering it's the longest stretch of time we've spent and will spend in the human realm. But there's also a sort of nostalgic fall atmosphere that naturally comes from what is, effectively, the Owl House Halloween special. Dana Terrace teased the Halloween aspect in particular during the New York Comic Con panel for Owl House about a week before Thanks to Them premiered, as well as a more detailed look at the setting of Gravesfield, Connecticut, a New England town with a history that's fittingly deep in witchcraft and superstition, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The autumnal color palette and mixture of early colonial to modern architecture makes Gravesfield feel truly lived in, similar to the way Blythe Hollow was designed in Paranorman, where the old colonial foundation is almost swallowed up entirely by the modern houses and buildings in the never-ending march of time. The backgrounds in Owl House have always been stellar, and I'll talk about them a little more much later on to give them their proper due. But I have to give a quick preliminary shout out to the lead location designer for season three, Sam Bozma. Bozma had built up quite the impressive resume during his time as a background artist for Steven Universe, and was part of the Owl crew since the show's beginning, credited as a location designer for every episode of the prior two seasons. So it only makes sense he'd get a bump to the lead designer for the final stretch, possibly due to his own New England roots. Having spent most of his childhood in the suburbs of Philadelphia, and attending the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. Capturing that New England autumn vibe in the backgrounds is one thing, but the warm shades of orange and yellow really complete the atmosphere, bringing to mind all those other Halloween specials you'd watch around this time of year. During a recent rewatch, Gravesfield's aesthetic actually reminded me of a similar vibe seen in Disney's adaptation of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow featuring a similar New England autumnal setting in an old colonialist town, albeit one that would be contemporary given the time period, but whatever, and is quite possibly one of the first things I think of when I think Halloween and Halloween specials. It's possible that the Owl crew drew some inspiration from Sleepy Hollow in developing Gravesfield, though the real-life state of Connecticut, where Dana Terrace was born and spent a good chunk of her childhood, has plenty of this atmosphere to offer all by itself. We often think of Salem, Massachusetts when we bring up witch trials in America, but it was actually Connecticut that had some of the first recorded witch trials in the fledgling colonies. Though very few records of these trials exist, the first victim is generally considered to be one Alice or Alce Young, who was hanged in 1647. A year later, the first confession of witchcraft was made, under extreme duress, by one Mary Johnson, who was hanged in 1650 following the birth of her child. Thus, the witch hunt hysteria in Connecticut would ultimately spiral into over 40 witchcraft cases over the next 23 years, 16 of these resulting in the accused's execution, making Luce's home state not just a fun little nod to Dana Terrace's own upbringing, but incredibly apropos for the Owl House, in more ways than one. Witches and demons are real. <gasps> and they're all sent from Mars to harvest human teeth to power their time machine. Watching this episode, you can definitely see the influence from the old towns and cities of Connecticut and the New England region as a whole. On top of the deep well of other Halloween-themed specials, movies, shows, and stories, even beyond what the target demographic of Owl House would be familiar with. Like, I'm 90% positive this discussion they're having in Luce's class about fate and free will is a shout-out to a similar scene in the original Halloween. Minus the psychotic killer stalking the main character, anyway. Well, actually... There's just such a different feel with All Saints Eve that makes for a great backdrop of any story. Equally capable of providing light-hearted frivolity, and a dreary sense of foreboding terror. Thanks to them has no shortage of either side of this Halloween coin, as we not only get to see little snippets of how the kids adapt to their temporary home and make the most of their amenities, 
but grapple with the fallout of the previous season's finale and the revelations that both Hunter and Luce tried to keep secret from the others. Focusing on the former first, it's doubtless that were season 3 a typical 20 episode affair, we'd have plenty of time for human world shenanigans involving their efforts in fixing up the old Evil Dead looking shack that the portal door always conveniently links to for some reason. as well as their efforts to rebuild the portal itself, have fun little slice-of-life outings, and blend in with their surroundings. Alas, in a 48-minute runtime, we don't really have that much time to spare. So it's a good thing there's someone who can help with that! Montage! <laughs> yes, unfortunately, these episodes have to rely on a lot of montages in order to convey what the characters are up to for large or small spans of time. And in any other show, their somewhat excessive use might be misconstrued for the creator's apathy or laziness. Which is why I'm really not looking forward to when someone inevitably releases THE OWL HOUSE IS BAD ACTUALLY AND HERE'S WHY that doesn't take into account all the mishandling from Disney and all the efforts the crew made into trying to wrap up their story as best they could. But we'll just have to burn that bridge when we get to it, I guess. Isn't the expression we'll cross that bridge when we get to- DID I STUTTER? Although the episode moves along at a fairly brisk pace, there are still several moments where the characters get to slow down and have fun little segments with each other. Such as Gus nerding out over all the human junk in Camila's basement, the girls protecting V from a digital alarm clock, and all the kids brushing up on their Spanish via a familiar and creepy bird app. Practice every day, or I'll appear in your nightmares. Oh. On the subject of Gus rooting through Camila's basement, this is where Hunter's fear of being discovered as a Grimwalker by the others is explored in a fairly subtle way, courtesy of good old Augustabeth, who has bonded quite a bit with Hunter ever since they got on friendlier terms back at Hexide. During the events of the finale, Gus attempted to restrain an enraged and goopified Belos by showing him some of his worst memories leading to Gus inadvertently learning about the Emperor's sordid past, including Hunter's true origin. Rather than come right out and tell Hunter he knows, he instead decides to broach the subject by relating their current predicament to a human sci-fi series he discovered, Cosmic Frontier, an epic and legally distinct odyssey set in the stars. Why would anyone want to go up there? I don't know. Humans like spreading the junk everywhere. Hunter takes an interest to the series through Gus's descriptions, especially latching on to the chief engineer character, O'Bailey, whose backstory Gus subtly relates to Hunter's own. And chief engineer O'Bailey, who's hiding as a clone from the enemy planet. It's easy to underestimate how impactful a fictional character can be in a relation to someone's own life experience. Obviously, most of the characters you see in fiction won't be a perfect one-for-one -for, -one for your life. That's what the little disclaimer at the end of every movie is for. But even for the relatively limited time we get to spend looking into the lives of these fictional beings, they can have certain qualities or react to certain circumstances in ways that feel so... familiar. Oh, he just like me. He just like me for real. Heck, you don't even have to relate to every bit of a character's personality to feel this. The reason I finally felt comfortable talking a little bit about my own experience with autism in the last video was because that whole segment of Ida and the Owl Beast resonated with me so perfectly. And while I may love Ida as a character, we are pretty night and day for a couple of reasons. There ain't nothing for you at that Dweebus factory. No offense, Dweebus. That's okay. I come from a long line of Dweebuses. Still, there is something to be said of those special connections you can make with a character who feels like you. And Hunter's connection to O'Bailey in particular helps him to not only get more comfortable with the idea of others knowing the truth, but becoming more comfortable with himself, too. Even if I'm not who I'm supposed to be, I like who I am right now. There are those who bemoan the fact that Hunter kind of took the spotlight away from the other mainstay supporting characters like Gus or Willow due to his somewhat abrupt inclusion in Season 2. And while I do wish we got a little more time for them to have some proper focus episodes, Hunter's development from blissfully ignorant henchmen 
to a teen steadily gaining independence and confidence after cutting himself off from an abusive parental figure, is a deeply affecting arc that even I, someone who grew up with a pretty well-adjusted upbringing, can appreciate. I've seen and heard plenty of stories of young adults who grew up in less-than-ideal situations, where they were taught bigoted or hateful ideals disguised as good morals where they were bullied or forced into spreading or maintaining these ideals to their peers, never really understanding how the rest of the world works beyond their narrow social circle. The us versus them mentality you see from conservative religious mindsets. It's a very simple question, Professor. Why do you hate God? Because he took everything away from me. Yes, I hate God. All I have for him is hate. Not to say that every conservative or religious upbringing would lead a person down a hateful or bigoted path, but especially in the more extremist branches of these subsects, the deeper ingrained you are in such a life, the harder it is to get out, physically and mentally. In Hunter's case, getting out of Belos's toxic grasp has had a very positive and very confusing outcome. Positive in that he can nourish legitimate friendships with Gus, Willow, and everyone else. But confusing because with this newfound sense of freedom comes all the incredibly existential questions that follow it. What was it like to be in the Emperor's Coven for so long? Do you miss it? I miss knowing who I'm supposed to be. And as Hunter spends more time away from Belos's influence, he starts to discover this answer for himself, and finds affirming support in the way the others treat him. Be it Gus sucking him into his terrible fandom, Willow patiently helping him salvage his spur of the trauma haircut, or in Luce casually telling him that he's practically an Aseta in all but legal documents at this point. Oh. <laughs> What makes this moment even more meaningful is how Hunter believed he didn't have any family left. Sure, he had Darius as a sort of mentor figure back home, but every other important figure in his life would never go as far as to call him family. The majority of the Coven heads, the Emperor's Coven at large, Kiki Mora? Ma'am, is everything alright? I just thought I heard an annoying voice. Definitely not Kikimura. Even his literal family with Belos was a largely transactional and abusive relationship, where the old buttwad would barely give him the time of day depending on whether he needed him or not. When he left all that, he truly believed he had no one. No one but his palisman Flapjack, anyway. So to hear Luce playfully and casually call him family, it cuts deep. The kind of cut that hits you right in the core. Or the kind of cut that goes clean through your finger, leaving a wound that you probably shouldn't get infected with any mysterious goop in the vicinity. You know, for hygiene's sake. Contrasting Hunter's positive development throughout this episode, we have an ample amount of time showing the inverse in how Luce expresses the guilt she carries over her role in Bellus's draining spell. Suffice to say... He was just a pawn in someone else's game, and he was never smart enough to realize it. If his friends and family knew about his mission, they'd know that their lives would never have been in danger if it weren't for him. They should hate his guts, and it would be better if he literally never existed. It's not great. Throughout the majority of this and the preceding episode, Luce's emotional health is at an all-time low, and it shows. There's barely a scene that goes by where her eyes aren't in a half-lidden, sunken state, and her body language is incredibly reserved. A far contrast from the energetic and outgoing teen with no sense of personal boundaries we met at the very start of the show. And sure, we get a few snippets of the old Luce here and there, like the scene where she officially comes out to her mom, or in some of the snapshots Willow takes of their time in the human world. But much like the previous times, Luce tried and failed to repress her emotions. Once she lets all the feelings of guilt and self-hatred bubble up inside her, she can't keep up a happy facade for very long, even for her loved ones. And much like the many other prior examples, 
she will try her absolute damnedest to never let on to anyone how she really feels. Lest she burden them needlessly with her own troubles that she feels responsible for in the first place. She does have a few moments where she opens up to Camila, if only a little. But when her mom doesn't have the reaction she was expecting, the reaction she was hoping to receive, she can't help but ask her. Mom, why aren't you mad at me? In some way, I'm actually kind of glad season 3 is as short as it is. Mainly because I don't think I could handle a dozen or so episodes with Luce hating herself as deeply as she does here. I'm not saying her emotional arc is bad or annoying, far from it. It's the fact that it's written so well and feels so relatable that makes it so hard to watch. I haven't had many bouts of intense self-loathing for my part, but I've known plenty of people who have and have at least had a few of those why aren't you mad at me moments in regards to my own mistakes. Not to mention my own bouts of depression or executive dysfunction. And knowing all that makes this line so hard, because Luce is basically asking her mom why she doesn't feel as angry or resentful towards Luce as she feels about herself. Caught in this terrible dichotomy of never wanting her loved ones to know the full extent of her part in the Day of Unity, and desperately needing comfort and reassurance that it's not her fault. And even though Camilla may have some right to be upset with Luce for running away, she demonstrates her understanding and patience by trying to comfort her daughter as best as she can with some pretty solid advice. Everyone makes mistakes. What matters is that you learn from them. However, in Luce's guilt-ridden brain, this solid advice of learning from her mistakes takes on a whole other meaning than what her mom probably intended. Not really helped when even her hyperfixation seems to be calling her out. How could you do it, villainous Lucy? How could you betray your friends? It was for the greater good. The greater good. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to downplay Lucy's trauma here, but... There is something so darkly comedic about villainous Lucy looking exactly like her right down to having her multi-track uniform from Hexide. Good Witch Azura 2 The Betraining was some 4D chess move to personally mess with Luce's day. We'll never forgive you. Never. I'll never forgive you, Finn! <laughs> On the subject of that hyperfixation, during this episode, we finally learn just what sparked it in the first place, when Camila accidentally stumbles on Luce's video diary. That conveniently only has about five relevant entries, with at least three dating back a good couple of years. Eh, I've seen worse plot contrivances. Somehow Palpatine returned. The oldest entries date to just after Luce and her parents moved into their new house in Gravesfield, and presumably not long after her dad's funeral wherein Luce reveals that he left her a particular book just before he died. I loved it! I loved it so much! <laughs> Through these video diaries, side note, you probably shouldn't invade your kid's privacy in a general sense, but there can be instances where it's a necessary evil. We see Luce find the spark that made her the bubbly, energetic, outgoing young lady we met in the first episode. And we get another example of how easily we can attach ourselves to a particular series or story that comes along during a time when we need it the most. The Azura series has been steadily mocked throughout the course of the show by practically everyone besides Luce and Amity, for its cliched tropes and extensive use of purple prose. Twice have I tarried at Tanabrak, yet ere have I kept my troth to thee, Azura. But underneath all the cynical mockery, there's a genuine heart to Luce's attachment to the series that goes beyond the typical low-hanging fruit of mocking a young adult fantasy aimed at girls. It's doubtless that a story of a fiery young witch going on a predetermined path of greatness and making new friends along the way inspired Luce while she was recovering from the trauma of her dad passing at such a young age. And it's the reason why she was so passionate about becoming a witch when the seemingly impossible opportunity presented itself. Heck, even Amity, the only other person we've seen latch onto these books as hard as Luce, probably got into the series for much of the same reasons. Wishing she could be as friendly and inspiring as Azura during her loneliest years in Hexide. 
putting on airs as the top student in her track. Straight hair, straight A, straight forward. Is it old hat to reference that song in the fandom yet? It's no wonder these two came together over their shared love for a series that, while more than a bit cheesy, still resonated with the most secret desires of their hearts. To be found, to be loved, to be... Well, hold that thought. It's a shame, then, that this love for a series that brought loose light in the darkest period of her life is seen as merely a distraction from what truly matters. Her schoolwork, her social life, or lack thereof. To the adults around her, Camilla included, the Azura books are holding her back and pose a serious danger of keeping her from applying herself. But, as Luce mentions in one of the newer entries, a day before the events of episode 1 in fact, it's not that she isn't trying to apply herself, it's that all the things she's naturally good at are beyond what school generally considers acceptable traits. And I can read and write witch tongue in five different dialects. It's been proven enough times already at this point, but the whole witch tongue in five different dialects alone shows how smart and dedicated Luce is when she's very passionate about something. It's just that, like so many other neurodivergent kids, traditional schooling can't let her express herself the way she would truly thrive if she could. The way she thrived once Hexide let her study all the tracks. The way she discovered all the basic glyphs and glyph combos to perform magic her own way. But I guess none of this is gonna matter on the SATs. It's also here where Camilla's unintentional snooping is justified. Again, case by case, don't at me. As Luce's latest entry sees her taking Camilla's advice to learn from her mistake in the worst way possible. On Halloween, after the hayride, I'm telling everyone I'm staying in the human realm. Permanently. A while ago, I watched a video that took a psychoanalytic look at Luce by YouTuber the Lovely Liz. Well, actually I watched a reaction to that video by Morgan Terry because I needed some background noise while I folded laundry and that's where the algorithm sent me that day, but I digress. Watching this video of a video, it was the combination of the original analysis by the lovely Liz and the personal reactions of Morgan Terry that made me realize I may have been unintentionally dismissive of Luce's perspective on being sent away to that summer camp. True, V was able to make the best of the situation in her stead, but that doesn't necessarily mean Luce would have had as easy a time acclimating to it. Indeed, all her shown experiences with other kids her age in the human realm, and the way she talks about how she was teased for off-screen experiences, it does cast some doubt as to how well she'd be able to find her people in that camp, or if they'd even be the same people V found. Heck, to go one step deeper, the very action of Camilla sending her to that camp even if she never meant to completely stomp out her daughter's interests, is enough to intensify any feelings of otherness that Luce felt pretty much all throughout her childhood. We see as much during an extended dream flashback sequence, where Luce's antics through various parts of her life earn her the ire of her peers and the scorn of other adults, with Camilla clapping back at them accordingly. Ugh, so unhygienic. That girl must have been raised by wolves. Hey, wolves are actually great parents! While these flashbacks show that Camilla was always willing to go to bat for her kid, the superintendent, at least that's what the fan wiki calls him, reminds Camilla of her own difficult childhood, effectively warning her that Luce may go through similar struggles if her creative outbursts aren't contained to a more socially acceptable level. You don't want Luce to struggle like you did, right? <gasps> There's a certain expectation that's put upon kids once they hit a certain age, spoken or unspoken, that they'll have to outgrow the things they loved at one point or another. When I was a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. First Corinthians. And sure, moving past certain interests is a natural part of growing up. I wouldn't expect a 13-year-old to eagerly catch up with the latest episode of Paw Patrol just because they watched it when they were younger. Now, Bluey, on the other hand, that's a whole other level. Look, I'm keen to get it done, but Chili, she wants to keep her options open, but I don't know. Do we want any more of these things running around? Hey! However, to any of the younger crowd who may be watching this vid, 
I'm sure you've probably noticed that the older you get, the more side eyes and indignant scoffs you receive when you admit to liking something that your peers or elders deem childish. Personally, I can remember being in the 7th grade PE locker room and getting mocked relentlessly for wearing something as innocuous as a SpongeBob SquarePants t-shirt. Who doesn't like SpongeBob? Indeed, there was a time when one was expected to eventually abandon watching cartoons or reading comic books or anything of the like that wasn't deemed mature in the eyes of the general public. We've seen this mindset fade a little in recent years, as more and more millennials and Gen Zers stick with the passions they held as kids. Maybe even manage to make a quick buck with them. Ahem ahem. But you'll still see this mindset alive and well on plenty of internet spaces, where any kind of enjoyment you find in your adult years is deemed as a sign of the regression of our society or some other pseudo-intellectual BS. At least I'm not all keyed up to watch a kid's show. I'll have you know that Duck Detective has a big mystery element and a lot of humor that goes over kids' heads. Unfortunately, this mindset was much more strictly enforced during Camila's adolescence, where she had to bury her own passions and hyperfixations when she got older and had to face more responsibilities. And she'll deny having any such passions nowadays even when it's pretty obvious that both her and her late husband were pretty big nerds. Funny how things just show up in basements, right? Without you hiding or putting them there. <laughs> Still, the superintendent's warning that Luce could struggle in school the way she did if her expressive outbursts aren't sorted out is a sad example of a parent going to extreme lengths to make sure their kid doesn't suffer the way they did at their age. Camila recognizes this as she reflects on her own traumatic memories and watches Luce's video diary, recognizing that her daughter is about to make the worst mistake of her life if she doesn't stop her, hauling ass to Old Gravesfield with V in tow to do just that. Now, the reason the Hex Squad is at Old Gravesfield is kind of long, involving the discovery of an old parchment buried under the floorboards of the Evil Dead shack that might be a clue to finding another portal door in the human realm. <gasps> the portal door! Portal door! Portal door! Portal door! Leading the team every which way across town, searching for answers in, you guessed it, another montage! <laughs> they eventually find the answer at the museum, thankfully under new management where one of V's old camp friends determines the parchment as a rebus and helps them decipher it. The hidden message pointing to Titan's blood somewhere in Old Gravesfield. Which, incidentally, happens to be holding a Harvest Festival Halloween night, spurring the gang to don elaborate and fitting costumes, as one side tries to surprise Luce with the new information that will hopefully lead them back home, and Luce tries to buck up the nerve to tell them she's decided to stay behind. Complicating the issue further is the aforementioned goop that keeps turning up like a bad penny. Or a rotting animal carcass on the side of the road. Or a dark shadow. Though he's in a severely weakened state thanks to his game of tag with the Collector, Belos has been able to sustain himself for the past few months by leaping from one animal host to the next biding his time until he could catch a bigger fish. So juicy, sweet. Infecting Hunter's body through the cut he got sewing, the more Belos learns of their potential discovery of Titan blood in the human realm, the more the Emperor starts to creep out. I'll say that again. Catch <laughs> you know, something about Belos was itching at me the more I thought about his character, and I think I figured it out a few months back. The way he has such a vendetta against witches and magic. The self-centered and sociopathic disregard he has for others, especially his own lackeys. And the way he's been hoarding the most powerful magical artifacts for himself for decades all reminded me of something I'd seen relatively recently. And that's when it clicked. This motherfucker is Jack Horner from Puss in Boots. I pronounce this batch delicious. Sure, the surface image that Belos has built up for himself over the centuries is in stark contrast to the overgrown man-child we see in Big Jack Horner. But once you dig deeper, and not even that deep, 
You realize that he's the same overgrown man-child with massive delusions of grandeur and an even worse case of main character syndrome. While the Hex Squad are at the Harvest Festival, they board a hayride that goes through another telling of the brothers Wittebane, an abridged version of the real history that transpired between them and a witch named Evelyn. To make a long story short, and with a little personal embellishment and headcanon on my part, while both brothers did have big dreams to become great witch hunters, when Caleb met a real witch in Evelyn and followed her back to the demon realm, he was presumably transfixed by how welcoming and inviting said realm truly was. Seeing the error in his misbegotten beliefs, he not only became friends with the witch he hunted, but something much more. Meanwhile, Philip, the dutiful younger brother that he was, believed that Caleb was spirited away by some terrible witch and gave chase, finding his way to the demon realm and learning that his brother vanished not because of his sacred duty, but out of love and acceptance for a witch. A fact that Philip just couldn't stand for after everything they'd been brought up to believe and everything they swore to do. Sounds like Big Bro got a hot witch girlfriend and Lil Bro got upset. What's impressive? I've been a boy the whole time! When you break down his motivations to their base level, the real reason Bellos went on his whole scheme of genocidal conquest was out of a sense of incredibly petty jealousy. An envy that his brother was able to let go of a dogmatic belief he thought they were going to pursue together when they were both seemingly less than ten. This ultimately makes Bellos even more pathetic than I thought. Yet he's wrapped himself in such an air of self-importance that he's truly convinced himself he's doing all these terrible things to save humanity. That it doesn't matter how many terrible atrocities he commits, because it's all for his definition of the greater good. The greater good. As a result of this noble crusade, He's not above threatening Luce's life once he finds out that she can perform glyph magic again, a sign that the Titan blood is close, saying he'll gladly dispose of her friends to continue the mission that he and his brother started, but not before one more act of incredible pettiness in revealing how she helped him meet the Collector nigh 400 years ago. You're so desperate to help people, you even helped me meet the Collector. What? This, in turn, leads into another patented Owl House fight, where the animation gets super smooth and super detailed and I have to restrain myself from geeking out because look at how fluid the animation is in this scene! The smoothness! The the whoosh the do the do the do the whoosh the whoosh the I gave a brief shout out to guest animator Tom Barkle in the last Owl House vid, in praise of his exemplary work on the first Lumity Kiss but he deserves a bit more time in the spotlight, as the impressive fluidity and movement on display here is only a small taste of his talent. The Aussie animator has acted as an independent agent for specific scenes in shows like Amphibia, and as part of the Flying Bark production team animating for shows like Lego Monkey Kid and Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Just looking at some of the scenes he did on Sakuga Buru, Sakuga Buru, Sakuga Buru, ah, uh, whatever, for these shows and the rise of the TMNT movie leaves me in complete slack-jawed amazement at the Baxter-esque fluidity and range of motion on display. And this is for a TV budget, too. Whatever this guy makes for his job, it's not nearly enough. Hashtag new deal for animation. While we're on the subject of additional animators, another who deserves a quick shout-out is Kofi Fiagome. Did we get the last name right? Uh, Fiagome. Ah, oh, shit. Another who deserves a quick shout out is Kofi Fiagome. Yes, well done, you said it. Another longtime member of the Owl crew, Fiagome has had credits for additional animation in the final two episodes of season one, and every episode after. Replacing season one supervising animator Spencer Wan on the super fluid and super detailed action sequences front. In his own paraphrased words, much of his job was focused on pre and post production of an episode selecting certain scenes to plus up, be they more action-oriented to give an extra sense of impact and weight, or in smaller character beats like the scene between a younger Ida and Lilith, which he cites as one of his personal favorites to work on. 
You may not always notice the scenes where Fiagome adds his special little touches, but they add a nice little panache to each episode that especially helped season 2 stand out animation-wise. I didn't really notice what he might have worked on specifically in Thanks to Them or the eventual finale, but my brain did. At any rate, we'll definitely see more of both Fiagome and Markle's talent before the show is done, so I'll save any more freaking out for then. Rest your ears. Getting back on topic, the fight is a challenging one for the Hex Squad, as they have to hold back their magic for fear that they may hurt Hunter, a crutch that Bellos exploits to gain the upper hand and Flapjack in the process. You wouldn't want me harming a precious palisman, would you? You're not gonna shoot a puppy, are you, Jack? Yeah, in the face, why? Before the gang can even beg for the poor bird's life, Bellos demonstrates just what a cold-hearted and petty bastard he truly is by gaining one final act of revenge on the witch who started his centuries-long crusade. Goodbye, Evelyn. <laughs> One kind of has to question how killing a bunch of innocent animals, handmade or not, factors into Belos's idea of the greater good. How can this be for the greater good? The greater good. Shut it! Hunter is able to gain back control before Belos can... ...do that, and defiantly tells his uncle that he wants to be rid of him and his influence for good throwing the titan blood into the water before Belos resumes control and jumps in after it, nearly drowning Hunter in the process were it not for Camilla's quick maternal instincts. Caleb, you would stab me in the back? You did it to him first. <sighs> Belos activates the portal and flees to the demon realm, the others desperately trying to revive an unresponsive Hunter. Flapjack fortunately seems to know what to do resting upon his chest and transferring his sap, I guess, into Hunter, dissipating into orbs of light as he does. Flapjack, don't, don't. I already know. The sudden and heartbreaking loss of Flapjack and Luce finally admitting to her friends that she did help Bellos meet the Collector further cements her decision her ultimate self-punishment for her greatest mistake. I think it'd be in everyone's best interest if I took your mama to the demon realm. Camila asserts that there's no way she'll let Luce or her friends face Bellos by themselves after seeing what he is and what he's capable of, while everyone else assures Luce that they, of course, don't hold Bellos' deception against her, and all prepare to take the next step in the final leg of their journey. All except for V, who isn't quite ready to return just yet, opting to keep an eye on the house instead. Thanks for the memories. We'll be back after we get some revenge. With a regained sense of duty in protecting her loved ones from Belos, the episode ends with Luce and her mom stepping through the portal back to the Boiling Isles. And what will they find on the other side? Will they be able to stop Belos from enacting his vengeance? save their home from the juvenile antics of the seemingly all-powerful Collector? And, most intimately, will Luce be able to forgive herself for her part in all this, now that her friends know the truth and hold no grudges against her? Or will she stay the course and leave the world she loves behind when it's all said and done? Well, I suppose such questions are better off left for the future. Meh? Meh? You like that? See, because the next episode is called- Oh, wait, wait. I should probably sum up my thoughts on thanks to them. Damn it. This was a really good segue. As I've said before, I'd much rather the Owl crew got to tell the complete story they wanted to, even if said story would probably be way different than what we have now. But this episode proves that the show being cut short was as much a blessing as it was a curse. True, I would have loved a proper half-season dedicated to human world shenanigans, and a little more focus on Willow, Gus, or V. Heck, even Amity is kind of sidelined a bit. But for how much they clearly had to condense, the overall end product is just as creatively written and emotionally captivating as some of the highest highs of Season 2. Fleshing out Camilla's misguided motivation to send Luce to the summer camp, 
and presenting the interesting split between Luce and Hunter's character arcs in the aftermaths of Hollow Mind and King's Tide. It's a strong start to a shortened season that proved these people still had the mojo to carry the show to an exciting and superlative conclusion. Of course, there were still two episodes to wait on at this point, and a good three months before we would see whether they could keep that mojo going. But such concerns would be best left for the future. Nah, forget it, the moment's past. To emphasize our long-awaited return to the Demon Realm, For the Future opens on King's perspective immediately after he forced Luce through the portal door, with the Collector gleefully celebrating their newfound freedom. It's like the whole world is singing! <laughs> King tries to mitigate the Collector's reckless power by insisting that everyone needs to be safe in order to play Owl House but he doesn't count on the Collector turning the residents of the Boiling Isles into dolls for the game, including Hootie and Lilith when they believe that King is in danger. <laughs> Ida tries her own hand, one to be precise, at saving her son, but loses control when the Owl Beast recognizes the Collector. You look fun! Wanna play? Fast forward to the present, and Luce's team step through the portal to the remains of the Isles, transformed into a near-unrecognizable state by the Collector. Rummaging through the ruins of the Owl House in Bonesboro, the team eventually come across the last of the Hexide Kids, who have turned the school into a safe haven from the Collector and his scouts. Though some, like Matholomew, wish to improve the conditions of Hexide and take the fight to the Collector when Luce returns with a battle plan, they are coldly rebuffed by Basha, who has appointed herself the de facto leader of New Hexide, alongside her totally new, never-before-seen assistants, Miki and Roka. They're transfer students! I am uh, Stefano. I am an Italian man. Fed up with Basha's bossiness, Matholomew agrees to help Luce dig through her memories in order to find a teleportation spell Philip used to travel instantly to the Titan's skull and confront the Collector who has set up their archive house just above it. Meanwhile, Bello seeks a new body to sustain his decaying form, and the rest of the kids deal with the fallout of Flapjack's death, and the uncertain whereabouts and safety of their loved ones. All the while, Luce maintains her position that once the Isles are saved and the Collector and Bellos are dealt with, she'll go into self-exile permanently, a plan that Camilla tries to talk her out of, if only her daughter would give her the chance. Communication is definitely one of the central themes of this episode, or at the very least, speaking truthfully about the pain you're going through. We see this both in several characters downright refusing to admit the pain, grief, or anxiety they feel in a feeble attempt to appear strong for everyone else's sake, and in how miscommunication and deceit ultimately end up making things worse, both in a micro and macro sense. The former is demonstrated pretty plainly through Hunter's single-minded goal of catching up to Belos, trying to brush aside any momentary distraction that might remind him of the loss of Flapjack, angrily lashing out at his friends when it seems they're losing focus, or in Luce steadfastly refusing to let go of the guilt she feels about… everything. We also see this from the other side with Willow's episode arc with her spending a lot of time trying to cheer all her friends up and act as the team's support, while ignoring her own emotions in an attempt to appear strong for them. It's not good if you try to hold it all in. I'm fine, really. Hopefully you've picked up by now that when I say strong, I'm referring to the incredibly warped belief that being honest about your emotions is a sign of weakness, especially when trying to dispel the worries and grief of the people around you. You see this, more often than not, as a classic example of TOXIC MASCULINITY! And this aspect is lightly explored in how Hunter decides to cope with his unprocessed grief. However, it's really Willow's arc that explores and challenges this notion of strength, as it pertains to how we react and process our grief and anxieties. 
Willow has always been something of a mom friend when it comes to her little group of weirdos. Someone they can come to for advice. Someone to calm them down and talk them through a bad situation. It's a great aspect of her characterization that's been there even before she started gaining more confidence in herself. But, as a consequence of putting so much emphasis on other people's well-being back when she had extremely low self-esteem, she's more or less taught herself to ignore and suppress her own feelings. To bury them deep inside where they have no possible hope of resurfacing. And then one day I'll die. Speaking as someone who has also tried to suppress his emotions, there's only so much time that can pass before this approach fails miserably. Especially when Basha falls back into old habits, and taunts her like the apocalypse isn't tearing the world apart just outside. Leading isn't easy, is it? All your time is spent helping the team, keeping people from fighting, planning your next move, and Titan forbid you show any weakness. Everyone else falls apart. Throughout the episode, Willow struggles to hold on to her chipper and optimistic facade. Not helped when she sees one of her dads as a pawn in the Collector's games. But it's telling that the real moment her mask starts to crack is when she tries to cheer Hunter up by showing him an old photo of him and Flapjack on their Flyer Derby team. His doleful reaction taking her aback. Oh, um, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to make things worse. Willow doesn't know it just yet, but getting this response from Hunter was the best thing she could have done for him as he spent the entire episode thus far stewing in his unexpressed sorrow and rage. Sorrow that the first real friend he ever made is gone, and rage at Bellows for taking Flap away from him. But, in this incredibly stressful and uncertain time, Hunter's flight-or-fight response must have kicked into overdrive, and caused him to ignore processing his emotions in order to chase after Bellows, who, in the brief scenes where we catch up with him, is desperately trying to suppress his own emotions regarding all that's happened since his master plan went south. Seeing flashes of his long dead brother, the bloody knife that ended him hanging just over his head. Is this a dagger I see before me? Uh, no, my lord. It's my handkerchief. You can sort of tell the difference if you look closely. It doesn't have as many sharp edges. Belos is basically the most extreme example of suppressing one's emotions the show has to offer, as the entirety of his backstory alludes to. And I use alludes because you do have to fill in quite a few holes yourself. Good job, Disney. But as I was saying when the Brothers Wittebane's story was expounded in the last episode, Philip had just as much an opportunity to abandon his misguided worldview as Caleb did. No doubt seeing the relationship that he and Evelyn fostered with each other the new family they were about to have. And it's clear that Caleb wanted his little brother to be a part of that. To join them in true unity, love, peace. Useless crap like that. But Philip, rather than talk things through with his brother, presumably followed his most extreme flight-or-fight response. And he fought. By God, he fought. And he's been fighting ever since fighting the guilt he's been suppressing and the knowledge that deep down, buried somewhere in that arrogant and prideful mask, he knows the truth. The truth that he killed his brother and has carried on their witch-hunting ways for no good reason other than paltry spite. After all, There's nothing scarier than knowledge. Boo! Just lie to me! Fittingly enough, this idea of suppression taken to its extreme also applies to Basha, who fills the role of tertiary antagonist for this episode after Belos and the Collector. In the past two videos I've made about Owl House, Basha has been little more than a footnote due to her characterization being more or less stagnant as the bitchy alpha teen who belittles those weaker than her to uphold her social standing. That's not even a complaint. With Amity's turnaround from bully to friend of the main cast, Someone had to fill that minor schoolyard antagonist role, and you could definitely do worse than Basha. Someone who exemplifies the warped belief governing the Isles that might makes right, and that it's the duty of the strong, like her, to stomp out the weak, like Willow, lest they bring the whole society down with them. What was that thing Patrick Stewart's character in The Prince of Egypt said? But one weak link can break the chain of a mighty dynasty. 
Yeah, that. Thanks. Uh, you? I legit forgot his name while I was writing this. The more we see Basha throughout the show, the more we see how feebly she tries to hold on to this worldview, even when it starts to crumble around her. Willow goes from a shrinking Violet who will silently shoulder all the mockery and torment she and her posse can throw at her, to a fiery and determined young athlete who can give even Basha a run for her money. Amity goes from the most valuable member of her clique, whom she practically sits at the right hand of, to someone who actively pursues friendship, even romance, with the lesser crowd, and wants nothing to do with her. She may be the captain and star player of the Banshees, and she may still be the most popular and feared girl at school, as she affirms to herself in the mirror during the Grudgeby episode, but what does that matter when the world as she knows it is over? So, in Basha's state of suppression, her world isn't over. The disastrous events of the Day of Unity basically never happened, and she goes on as the self-appointed leader of New Hexide, pushing others around and asserting her dominance as top dog, doubtlessly spurred by the Collector dollifying two members of her Grudgeby team at the start of their game, and inflamed by the influence of her newest yes-man, Miki, the Rasputin to her Romanoff the worm tongue to her Theoden, the Kikimora to her Belos. Hey, wait a minute! <laughs> Long time no see, human. Nobody react to what I'm about to tell you. I think that kid might be the Avatar. After Basha and Kikimora throw the Hex Squad, and Mythalmiel, into the detention pit, the latter unintentionally separating them as she tries to exact her revenge. Basha attempts to get Amity back on her team, if you will, saying it can be just like old times if they rule New Hexide together. Maybe even better! There are those who read Basha's clinginess to Amity in this scene as some kind of unspoken romantic attraction to her, and who knows, maybe she did or does feel that way. But I don't necessarily read it like that, given everything else I've said about her in this episode. Basha is in a deep state of denial and repression, using her leadership to pretend like everything is exactly the way it was. But even with Kikimora feeding into her ego, without her friends by her side, she'll always have that nagging reminder that, no, things are pretty f***ed actually. So when Amity finally comes back from Titan knows where, Basha leaps for the chance to gain some kind of familiarity back in her life. Any kind of normalcy. Even when she knows Amity isn't that kind of person anymore and never really was to begin with. And even though Amity owes her nothing, she still gives her old captain a chance to truly redeem herself and try to make things truly better for everyone. I can't be who you want me to be, Basha, but we can still save your teammates. Will you let us try? It's funny, isn't it? How when the characters actually sit down and address their emotions, rather than go around in circles trying to deceive each other or deny their feelings, their problems get solved much sooner. If only somebody would tell this to, like, half the cast in this episode alone. This includes King, whose plotline sees him being something of a foil for Kikimura, acting as the Collector's hype man as they play their games stating their desires out of fear of what they may do to their playthings if they get angry. Unlike Kikimura, who intentionally feeds into Basha's worst traits, King tries to act as a sort of conscience or ethical bug to the Collector, telling him that he shouldn't treat others so callously, as if they were mere throwaway toys. Even playing pretend has consequences. A cranky old witch taught me that. Further contrasting Kikimura, who is clearly only allying herself with Basha to use her power, the much-coveted power of a 15-year-old kid. King legitimately seems to care about the Collector, at least to some degree, reading him a bedtime story when he requests one, and allowing him to borrow his precious Francois, even if he draws the line at actually letting him hold it. Can you at least leave him to watch over me? I don't like being alone. Where he and Kikimura have one unfortunate similarity, is that King is keeping his share of secrets from the Collector too. 
mainly that Ida is out of her beast form, and that she and Lilith are conspiring with him to get things back to normal again. Also, this doesn't have any relevance to what I just said, but who's a for a Lulu reunion? Oh, oh end me. Hey, you. Oh, Lulu. It be, it be. Hoodie, you keep finding new and impressive ways to creep me out. This secrecy comes back to bite them when the Collector's Castle receives an uninvited guest. As Belos in his goopified state desperately seeks a host, when the bones of either his long dead brother or past Grimwalkers fail to give him a new body. And he just so happens to find the perfect one, as Odalia uses the dollified coven heads to help tend to the Collector's housekeeping. Me? No. <laughs> Rain may have only been a stepping stone in Belos' ultimate goal, as he uses them to sneak into the Collector's room, where he plans to either possess the child and use their almighty power for his own purpose, or smother him in his sleep to gain some good old-fashioned vengeance. Either way, he doesn't get very far, as the Collector immediately senses the danger, with Belos saving face by warning him about King's intentions. Though initially dismissive, Belos Rain is persuasive enough to have the Collector check in on him and the other Clawthorns, catching them in the middle of a very unflattering conversation. The Collector needs to be stopped for good, and I think I know a more permanent solution. Of course, as is the way in most media, the Collector checks out of the conversation just when King clarifies that he doesn't want to hurt or trap them like his father did before telling the others that he has formed some genuine kinship with them, even for how awesome and terrifying their power is. Because, not too long ago, King behaved very much the same way when he only thought he was a despotic ruler of all demons, never really understanding proper empathy until he made a lot of mistakes during his friendship with Luce, learning to value others as much as he does himself. Let me talk to him, immortal being to semi-immortal being. It's worth a try if no more people get hurt, right? Can you imagine all the problems that would be solved if characters actually stuck around to hear out the entire conversations people have about them? Bart, I'm going to get you. <gasps> Some ice cream at the store since I'm saving so much money on Diet Cola. But alas, twould be no plot if the Collector wasn't swayed to distrust King by Bellos Rain. Brain? Raylos? Blaine? Okay, now it's just starting to sound like a ship name. Gross. Nor would the presence of Luce and the others be brought to their attention to further sow discord and keep suspicion away from Belos as he cozies up to them. You know what? That was also gross. Let's change the subject. <laughs> the last major character arc we have to discuss is the continuation of Luce's extreme guilt complex, which hasn't gotten any better, even after the others absolved her of any wrongdoing. You were tricked. That's what Bellus does. He tricks people. But if it weren't you, it would have been someone else, and then there'd be no one left to fight back. It's come to a point where she even blames herself for the state of her palisman, still in its egg form months after carving it. Amity tries to reassure her by stating her palisman, Ghost, didn't immediately come to life for her either. Doing so only after a deep introspection and stating that, after an entire childhood of her parents deciding her future for her, whatever she ends up doing with her life, she wants to choose for herself. But this advice only serves to remind Luce that her wants always seem to cancel each other out. Her desire to be a witch ending up hurting others when she takes it too far. Her desire to help others often leading to stickier situations than she intended. The poor girl has gotten to such a dejected state that she recoils from a reassuring kiss from her girlfriend, believing that she doesn't deserve such affection or comfort. This is also why, when Camila puts on a brave face and tries to act like she isn't completely wigged out by all the creepy and weird imagery in the aisles, Luce tells her mom that she doesn't have to pretend for her sake. After we rescue Ida and King, I'm staying in the human realm, permanently. It's for the best. Wait, let's talk first. Camila has a talk with Willow and Gus where she vaguely alludes to Luce's decision. She's so determined to make herself sad and... <sighs> I don't know how to help. 
Gus and Willow tell her about a time where Gus felt he deserved to be punished for a school project he failed, with Gus eventually postulating that it wasn't so much his own failure that bothered him, but the possibility of failing in the eyes of his dad, whom he always wanted to make proud. This gives Camila the inspiration she needs to tackle Luce's guilt-wracked brain when the time comes, and there's no better time than after they narrowly escape a berserk Kikimura and Luce starts berating herself for letting her and Basha get the jump on them. Ah, my whole plan fell apart! I messed up again! What are you talking about? It doesn't matter. No, Miha. It does matter. Camila talks about the many mistakes she's made in her life. From simple screw-ups like road rage at Luce's principal, or being involved in a pyramid scheme for three years. As you do. To more serious ones, like uprooting their lives and moving to Gravesfield in order to be closer to a quote, fancy hospital, in an ultimately feeble attempt to help her ailing husband. But the biggest mistake Camila relates is one she equates to something called the Astral Oath. The Astral Oath is a promise made between Captain Avery and his family to love and protect each other just as they are through supernovas and solar winds. Mom, are you a secret nerd? Through finally admitting her own hyperfixation to her daughter, Camila is apologizing for not standing up for Luce when she needed her most, for assuming that sending her to that summer camp was the best case scenario to keep her childhood from being as painful as her own. Because, as I said in the last video when talking about Ida's relationship with her mom, it's often through a parent's earnest attempts at helping their children where they can hurt them the most. My biggest mistake was trying to protect you by changing this beautiful, good witch into something she wasn't. It's through this communication that Luce finally realizes her deepest wish, the innermost desire that eluded her back when she tried and failed to connect to a palisman, the key she needed to finally let her palisman take its own form. The one thing she's wanted from the very beginning of the show. From her peers, her elders, and especially her mom. The only thing I've ever really wanted was to be understood. This beautifully realized scene naturally has a lot of people to thank for it. From Haley Wong's initial storyboard to Peggy Shee's color script and Sean Respond's color design. but the shot was given an extra helping of oomph by frequent Owl House storyboarder and writer, Emmy Cicerega, an artist who has worked on several other Disney Channel hits, like Gravity Falls and the DuckTales reboot. I've been a big fan of her art style for well over 15 years at this point, and if that made me feel old saying it, just imagine how she might feel hearing it. Miss Cicerega, please don't watch this video. So it's been especially satisfying seeing her involvement in all these shows I love. Seeing genuinely talented people succeeding in something they're really good at is always great, even if you haven't been following them half your life. Wait, half my life? Oh God! <laughs> Continuing the trend of properly communicating one's feelings, when Hunter and Gus stumble upon Willow in the detention pit, She's frantically trying to keep her powers from spiraling out of control after her run-in with Basha, and her lingering sense of guilt believing she's only made Hunter feel worse, culminating in her vines nearly suffocating all of them as she admonishes herself for her failure. Basha's brave. I'll always just be half a witch willow. Hunter, no stranger to being deemed half a witch himself says balls to that and is able to tap into a magic inside himself to snap her out of it. A magic that Flapjack left for him as one final gift. He tells Willow that she actually helped him process his emotions by acknowledging he was suffering, and encourages her to do the same, telling her the moral that even the most reliable of us need to hear every now and again. It's okay to feel sad sometimes. I miss my dad. <laughs> The Hexolios manage to escape the detention pit and meet up with Luce and Camila, the former still getting the hang of her staff in its infancy. Luce has a staff. Why does that make me nervous? As they do battle with Kikimura, the students of Hexide, including Basha, hold her off. 
giving Luce and the others the time they need to draw the glyph combo to teleport them straight to the Titan's head, barely avoiding one last blast from her Hulkbuster in the process. Well, you really beamed us up, eh, old Bailey? <gasps> Beam us up! Beam us up! In the midst of the revelry, Luce's palisman finally takes the form of its choosing. With everyone guessing wildly of what it will be from a snake to a bat to a football playing king in space. Turns out, when the palisman was asked what form it wanted to be, it said yes and formally introduces herself as String Bean, a snake shifter Boo! who can take any form she desires, basically making her the palisman equivalent of. Would you do the honors, Chucky? Gender fluid. This revelation might have a little more significance to those who waited literal months to see Luce's palisman hatch, and came up with all kinds of theories of what animal it would be, based on little clues like Luce's affinity for snakes, or the bat icon that represents her in that Tamagotchi thing she and Amity chat with. But it's also just incredibly fitting for a character like Luce to end up with a palisman like this, reflecting not only her own gender non-conforming habits, but her unquenchable thirst to explore and study absolutely every kind of magic she can get her hands on. The outgoing and eternally friendly personality that she's always had, and has finally come back after she's learned to accept herself and her failures. That's why I'm firmly in Camp Stringbean and will take absolutely no slander from those who call her cringe or too OP or any other bullcrap they can spew. And she's also just the cutest thing ever. If you really don't love her, then you have no f***ing soul. This is lame. Ow! You're lame! Unbeknownst to the Hex Squad, this joyful scene has an audience. Bellos further goading the Collector into believing that Luce has come to help King conspire against him. To trap him in another inescapable prison and throw away the key. Instigating the Cosmic Child by asking them what they'll do now. I think I want to play a new game. I've seen a few people online regard this episode as the weakest of the Season 3 trilogy, and in some respects I can kind of see why. From a character writing perspective, it remains just as stellar as thanks to them. But the pacing definitely took a serious hit from how much catch-up we had to receive in the form of new Hexide and the state of the Boiling Isles as a whole. It might also be a case of sour grapes, because there is a lot of potential here for pretty much everything we saw to take part over multiple episodes were Season 3 a more conventional season. Of course, I don't blame the Owl crew for that, but I definitely would have liked to see even half of the new Hexide stuff expanded. Maybe even build a proper La Resistance with any of the other survivors across the aisles once Basha cooled her jets. Especially with Captain Tholomule and his team seeming to be pretty gung-ho on going out and saving whoever they can. Captain who? Wait, has Tholomule been your last name this whole time? Still, for what we get, it's not bad by any means. And I even hesitate to call it the weakest of the bunch upon my most recent rewatch. It builds on the strong character arcs the previous episode had, and uses new arcs from characters like Willow to draw parallels and help resolve them. It also shows a different side to the Collector, a character whose sudden inclusion in Season 2 meant that I and many others couldn't get a proper reading on his status as a potential antagonist. Whether he truly was just a little kid with no sense of empathy, or if he would evolve into something worse and even more dangerous than Bellos. Taking the former approach was definitely the more interesting choice, but even with the empathy King has for him, their behavior and the ominous nature of the final scene proves that he's still not a being to trifle with, as the Owl Gang will soon discover in the final episode of Season 3 and the final episode of the show as a whole where not only will they have to contend with the anger of the Collector, but the scheming machinations of Belos, who will stop at nothing to accomplish his ultimate mission. Can they make peace with the cosmic godlike entity and defeat the evil Emperor? What sacrifices will they have to make in the process? Is there any hope that the Isles can go back not just to the way things were, but possibly better than before? Or is it all just an impossible dream as the world slips ever into chaos? 
All we and the witches and demons of the Isles can do, as our heroes move closer to their final battle, is keep watching and dreaming. Nailed it. Picking up immediately where the last episode left off, the Hex Squad are separated by an enraged collector. The majority of them strung up on strings, while Luce is blinded by a light. Rather than revving her up like a deuce, it leaves her in the limbo-like world between the human and demon realms she's found herself in twice before. The first time was back in Season 2, when her makeshift portal door didn't work quite as intended, and the second time was actually in For the Future, where Luce caught a brief glimpse of a mysterious figure before being pulled out to the demon realm by Amity. Perhaps as a consequence of the Collector's magic, she only sees a close-up of the liquid-like essence in that limbo-like state, while she hears the faint cries of what we can only assume was the mysterious figure from before, trying to wake her up. Luce awakens in Belos's old castle, decked out in his old robes, no less. Hey, I'm gonna bust you up, plum fam, and then I'm gonna wear your clothes! That was weird. And wanders the empty hallways with Stringbean, desperately trying to find anyone else. And she finds them. No! No, no, no! If you'll allow me to pull back the curtain a little early, Luce is trapped in some kind of nightmare state where she's told by her friends and girlfriend what an awful person she is, and how everything terrible that's transpired the past few months is her doing. Living out her worst fear that she's no better than Belos for her carelessness. Unbeknownst to Luce, Ida and King are plagued by the same nightmare visions, the Collector forcing them all to face their most heightened fears, like he was Scarecrow in an Arkham game or something. Ooh, that's actually a little creepy, can we use something else? That's better. Whereas Luce has to live out her fear of being like Belos, Ida has to live out her guilt at all the harm she's caused with her curse. Her own family calling her a dangerous beast, her father receiving another scar to even out his face. King, meanwhile, doesn't even have the luxury of his friends or family to torment him, finding himself among the Titan Trappers once more, ready to help him join his birth family. All this would be enough to drive anyone to their breaking point, and just one episode ago, Luce might find herself completely agreeing with the worst of what her friends are saying about her. But if there's one thing Luce can't abide, even in this state... I challenge you to a witch's battle! It's misquoting her favorite series. It's, I challenge you to a witch's duel. Not which is battle. The Collector pulls the Hex Squad away once the jig is up, but not before they tell her about Ida and King, giving her exactly what she needs to wake herself up, along with the other original weirdos. <gasps> as touching and cathartic as this reunion is, as well as the proper introductions to Stringbing, there is still the matter of the Collector, who, without a trace of malicious irony, equates everything he's done to just playing a game. Something the others don't take very kindly, considering all the people he's dollified and all the lives nearly lost during the Day of Unity. So? Toys break all the time! You just fix them! This episode delves a little deeper into the Collector's psyche, further emphasizing that everything he does isn't really motivated by a sense of revenge or sadism. Sure, he can have a pretty mean vindictive streak if you slight him or the people he likes enough, as Belos and Terra Snapdragon happily demonstrate. But the Collector doesn't really keep that sense of vindictiveness for very long, quickly moving on to whatever other game he wants to play, and whatever other playmate he has in his immediate vicinity. This is in pretty sharp contrast to the initial impression I had of him way back in Season 2, where he seemed to take fiendish glee in the idea of the draining spell. An impression that Luce carries over as she recaps all she saw to the others. Let's slash and rend and crush and bruise! Let's curse the land and knife right use! 
Heck, the very first impression we got of them in one of the Owl Beast's memories seemed to showcase a downright nasty piece of work who found hunting and trapping a relatively harmless beast as a great way to spend an afternoon. However, there's not insubstantial evidence in the show to suggest this robed figure we see wasn't the collector we're most familiar with. For one, they're much taller. And for second, the murals in the archive walls paint a story of other beings similar to the collector. Beings who apparently have made it their mission to travel to all manner of worlds and archive the local inhabitants. As said in a poem King reads to the collector for a bedtime story, Collectors live long, we watch things pass. To preserve, to observe, we must amass. What flies, what swims, be it predator or prey, seal them up so that they never fade. So it seems that these other collectors, or archivists as they're later called, act as an invading force scouring a planet's culture, beasts, and peoples for their own collection. Not unlike how many Western countries amass artifacts in their museums that were, more often than not, stolen from poorer countries and weaker people than themselves. How do you think your ancestors got these? You think they paid a fair price? Or did they take it like they took everything else? In a twisted sort of way, the archivists may have seen themselves as doing some kind of noble work, gathering all this knowledge from far off places to preserve in their archives forever. Their treasure wasn't gold, it was knowledge. Knowledge was their treasure. However, it's a bit doubtful that they were truly this altruistic in their intent. As the Owl Beast's aforementioned flashback portrays one of them in a pretty intimidating light, and the rest of the poem that the collector scribbles out in favor of their own ending shows what they'll do if anything or anyone gets in the way of their collecting. But playing is more fun, so I'm gonna make friends instead, the others stink, boo. It seems the collector didn't have a very high opinion of their older siblings either, as the murals show him largely ignored by them up until they told him to go down and scout out the planet that would become the demon realm for them, meeting the Titan babies and deciding to be their playmate. Much of this is explained by the Collector himself later on, but a good chunk is still left to our own interpretation. You can argue whether or not this is good storytelling, but again, the crew had a pretty shortened time frame to work with. They may all be great, but they're not infallible. Personally speaking, there is something I've really come to appreciate about a story that lets you fill in a lot of the gaps yourself, based on the slightest bit of juicy background information. We also have this with the portraits in Bellos' mindscape, more or less painting out his whole life story if you care to look for it and fill in the holes. I don't know, maybe it's just the From Software nerd in me that's grown accustomed to drawing out whole backstories through icon descriptions and character-given info dumps. Or, you know, just waiting for Vatividia to explain it all for me. The Archivists and the Collector, godlike beings from the stars beyond, come to the Demon Realm for a purpose of collecting and- Sh Should I do the voice? Mm-mm. Meh, I'll just read normal. It was during the Collector's time playing with the Titan babies that the Archivists learned, either from observation or the Collector telling them, that their powers aren't effective against Titans for whatever reason, leading the Archivists to begin exterminating them. It also seems, if the latter is true, that the Collector didn't learn their lesson on repeating this strange fact to anyone so openly, casually telling Belos Rain that even if he wanted to follow their advice and wipe out the Owl Gang, his powers don't work on King specifically. The dog? Yeah! Cause he's a Titan! The Collector also reveals that a full-grown Titan's power would be even more formidable, pointing out the fact that the heart of the very titan that makes up the Boiling Isles is still beating centuries after its death. Bit of a tangent, but this revelation possibly means that Belos decided to put his throne room right under the titan's still beating heart, not for any power it might possibly possess, but because he thought it made him look cool. What an edge, Lord. Have you ever had the entire basketball team convince you that if you get up on top of the school, run off as fast as you can, and spread my arms? They told me I could float like a sugar glider! And guess what? I jumped off, I fell 20 feet, and I broke my f***ing foot! Upon learning all this, Bellos Rain tells the Collector to try and win the Owl Gang's favor by showing them all the fun games he has, 
buying Belos all the time he needs to make his way back to the throne room, much as Rain tries to resist him. Meanwhile, the Collector tries to break the ice by assuring them all that he doesn't want to scare them anymore, content instead to play all manner of fun games with them. And the best way to showcase even a fraction of these games in such a relatively short runtime is through... ANOTHER MONTAGE! Being soundly bested in each of these games, the Collector sulks to themselves before Luce tries to talk candidly with them. The Collector bemoaning how everyone has betrayed or blamed him for things he didn't mean to do. Such as when the Titan imprisoned him after most of their kind were wiped out, seeing him as responsible. This might also be a sort of meta-commentary on how many, including myself, viewed the Collector during their first appearance. A shadowy figure helping Belos to enact his terrible plan to wipe out virtually all life on the Boiling Isles. A cosmic entity who tears apart the Titan's skull for a lark. Surely a being this powerful will undoubtedly be a terrifying enemy the gang has to overcome if they hope to save their world. Right? No. Like many characters in this show, the Collector isn't that simple. True, they have a severe empathy problem, but they're also not totally uncaring either. When Terra snaps he at the Collector during one of their games, they only really lose their temper when she insults King, and respects King's boundaries enough that he doesn't bully or threaten him when he refuses to let the Collector sleep with Francois. It seems that, more than enjoying the suffering of others, the Collector latches onto the person closest to them trying their best to please them by giving them what they want, as long as they promise to keep playing with them. Which is why he eagerly went along with Belos's draining spell, seeing it as a small stepping stone to being released, and being able to play with his special friend who would never, ever, 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 ever betray him. Ever. Never. But the saddest thing of all about this immortal being with the emotional maturity of a six-year-old is that deep down, they realize that King isn't hanging out with them just because he likes them. But the Collector wants so desperately to have a friend, to have someone who won't use or betray them, that they go along with it for as long as possible. I know it's just pretend! I don't care! I'll pretend as long as I want! I'm all too aware of latching on to the closest thing you might have for a friend, even if the relationship is largely one-sided or completely toxic. That was most of my middle school experience circa 7th grade. And speaking from that personal experience, to a lonely mind that might have trouble connecting with people for one reason or another. Even a bad connection made with one or more people is still preferable to being alone all the time. At least here, you're not completely on the outside looking in, even if it feels like it most of the time. The Owl Gang have plenty of experience being on the outside, too, each of them relating to the Collector's struggles in being misunderstood, feared, or abandoned. Which is why Luce offers to walk them through how they all found each other, and stuck together as their genuine weirdo selves. Though hesitant, the Collector plays along, leading us on a little trip through memory lane as we revisit the Owl House, the Hexide Grudgeby Arena, and the Titan's Knee where Luce learned her second glyph by connecting to the elements. During their expedition, the Collector tries making a few friends of his own, but is coldly, if not understandably, rebuffed. Asking Luce how she was able to make friends with people like Lilith or Amity without forcing them. People are complex, and sometimes they just need a little kindness and forgiveness. As this goes on, Amity manages to wake herself and the rest of the Hex Squad up, and Bello swarms his way closer and closer to the Titan's heart. Rain fights back as best they can, managing to expel him from their body and put up a decent defense as he gets dangerously close to his target. But all Belos needs is just one little part of himself to possess the Titan's heart, spreading his sludge across the entire aisles like a fungal infection. Or the smooths from My Little Pony. Something's 
stop me. Traveling to Belos's castle, the Owl Gang witness Belos take on a titan-like form that begins attacking the Isles, set to finish off what he started during the Day of Unity. Finally, I can cleanse this perdition myself. Perdition in Christian theology a state of eternal punishment and damnation into which a sinful and unpenitent person passes after death. Unsure of how they can even hope to fight back against Belos's new form, the Collector steps in to put Luce's advice into practice, rushing at full speed to Belos and trying to offer him the kindness and forgiveness that they never received. You just need kindness and forgiveness, huh? They're such pools of vulnerability. It's so cute how you think that would work on me. Don't you know I'm dead inside? As Belos tries to make the Collector dead outside, Luce rushes in to protect them, taking the bullet as Belos's sludge takes hold of her. I feel like I should be used to this feeling by now, but I still don't know what to say. Oh, why does every spunky 14-year-old Disney isekai protagonist evaporate into orbs of light? <laughs> Though the Collector initially doesn't understand what happened to Luce, as her light travels across the aisles, we get the impression that those who witness it somehow realize she's gone. Emphasized by Camilla, still in doll form, sobbing uncontrollably. And as King and Ida lose their shit and go into full beast mode, the Collector feebly tries to fix Luce the same way he did his toy earlier. The realization of what death truly means for mortals finally sinks in, as he tries to calm King and Ida down, not wanting to lose them too. I'm sorry for everything! <laughs> what is this stuff? Why won't it stop? It's a bit refreshing to see just how low Belos will stoop as a villain, considering there's been an ample amount of villains in kids' cartoons that ended up more or less redeemed by the show's end. And don't get me wrong, I like a good redemption story or fleshed out antagonist as well as the next person, but sometimes it's not enough to offer an olive branch to a deeply deplorable person, especially when they themselves don't want it. Sure, I'd like to believe that everyone has some goodness in them and is capable of change, but a cold lesson you learn in life is that some people genuinely don't care about how their actions impact others. Some people are so caught up in their own distorted and self-serving worldviews that they're incapable of change. Some people, whether we like to admit it or not, are just plain horrible. That was horrible! Your wish is horrible! You're horrible! You're an irredeemable monster! Oh, oh, what took you so long, idiot? There's another kind of harsh lesson in relation to this. Just because these horrible people may draw out the worst thoughts from you, that doesn't automatically make you the same as them. Something Luce especially has to learn. But wait, you ask, how can Luce learn anything? She's dead. <laughs> and the people who ask that are once again the sort of people who really should have watched the show first. Like, come on, I've given you ample opportunity to stop this video and go watch it. Seriously, returning viewers are great for the algorithm. Indeed, just before Luce finds herself sinking into the water between worlds, she's pulled up at the last minute by the figure she'd seen before. Someone very familiar once she finally gets a good look at them. Oh, Titan. Oh, me. Nice to meet you, Luce the Human. The Titan hereafter referred to as Papa Titan for simplicity's sake, though he doesn't seem to care either way. I think King said it best once. I am both king and queen, best of both things. <laughs> but dad works fine. Gender fluid. Has been stuck in this limbo-like state for the past few centuries, though he's still able to keep a watchful eye on King and the family he's cultivated in his absence. Which is why he was most eager to finally meet Luce in particular and offers some words of kindness when she admits that she wanted nothing more than to see the Collector utterly obliterate Belos when he had the chance, admitting to her that he was wrong to imprison the Collector for a crime they didn't commit, even if, in his eyes, it was to protect his last child. 
Luce wonders then if this impulsive and intrusive desire for retribution makes them no better than Belos. Bello says he's trying to save humanity, and we're saying we want to save our families, so isn't that the same thing? Don't, don't these feelings come from the same place? I'm sure a lot of people watching can probably recognize and relate to this morality paradox. Speaking as an American in particular, the past eight years as a whole have filled my brain with more than a few intrusive thoughts concerning certain elected officials or other peoples in positions of high authority and bowling alleys. Which is weird because I'm usually not much of a bowler. I joke about it, but there are genuine moments in my life where even I can be caught off guard by these thoughts. These dark what ifs, these twisted payback fantasies. I'd like to think I'm not a violent person by nature. Not someone who enjoys watching others, even people I don't particularly like, suffer. But when I think about the Belloses in real life, the kinds of people who use their positions of power to exert bigotry and discrimination on anyone they don't like, to make life harder for those groups they deem as lesser, immoral, aberrations of God Almighty, the primal part of my brain can't help but trigger imaginations, dare I say aspirations, of revenge. To someone like Luce, whose natural disposition is anything but vindictive. The very idea of wanting the Collector to do away with Belos once and for all must be an intrusive thought that shakes her to her core. But that's the thing about intrusive thoughts. They're, well, intrusive. A gut reaction in response to an extreme situation or emotion. They don't necessarily reflect your own values, or what you would really do on the off chance you and certain self-righteous individuals were alone in a bowling alley. <laughs> Looking at the state of the world and seeing the kinds of people who seem to get off on the suffering they inflict, any kind of revenge scenario you come up with, even if you have no intention of ever following them through, might seem like stooping to their level. It's not hard to imagine that many in the Owl crew were wrestling with these thoughts the same as countless others in the wake of rising bigotry and indifference. It's a purely human emotion to seek justice after injustice, after all. We should defend ourselves! An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth! Very good. That way the whole world will be blind and toothless. But Papa Titan puts it in perspective. You assume Belos's goal comes from a genuine place. But that man doesn't care about anything but his need to be the hero in his own delusion. And because of that, he fears what he can't control. The key difference between the Belloses and Luces of the world is that one side will act on their worst impulses to serve only themselves and satisfy their place in their own narrow worldview, while the other side will steady these thoughts, fighting only to protect the downtrodden and oppressed of the world. A fight that Luce herself will have to rejoin soon, once Belos's muck starts to take over Papa Titan's body. What? What can I do? You've already helped King so much, so let me use my last bit of life to help you. You might think that this scene sort of contradicts one of the show's major themes established all the way back in Episode 2. That no one is a chosen one, and predetermined paths of greatness are a load of malarkey. That if we all waited for a prophecy to come and tell us we were special, we'd die waiting. And that's why you need to choose yourself. That the long-renowned Titan of the Boiling Isles seems to handpick Luce specifically to grant her their power might feel like the show sort of backpedaling this message at first glance. But no, it's absolutely not. If anything, the show had already thoroughly deconstructed the predetermined path of greatness idea with the steady time loop Belos enacted once he realized Luce was the one who taught his past self the final glyph he needed to meet the Collector. In the ambiguously evil words of the G-Man, The right man in the wrong place can make all the difference in the world. In the same vein, Luce wasn't specifically handpicked by Papa Titan in preparation for this moment. All the cards just happened to fall into place where he could do her a kindness and save her, as she had done King a kindness by becoming his surrogate older sister. 
It's doubtless that even if Bellos weren't about to destroy the Boiling Isles, he'd have at least tried to help bring her back to life. But since she's already here, and he likes her enough already, he figures she might as well take his power while he can still offer it, turning the tide of the final battle in their favor, but only if Luce decides whether to accept this power or not. So the question is, will you choose yourself? With the last of his strength, Papa Titan sends Luce back to the Boiling Isles, sporting a rather impressive limit breaker at that. As Belos' sludge continues to spread, and the Archive House threatens to fall, the Collector rushes to keep it afloat, even as he himself is overtaken by Belos' muck. From inside the floating palace, the Hexquan and Camilla rush to protect the Dolify denizens, and Luce, King, and Ida muster all their strength against the increasing infection in one gloriously kick-ass animation sequence. With Luce using conventional magic and the powers of a titan alongside her found family. I mean, do you not see all that's going on in this sequence? The bounciness, the fluidness, the whoosh and the whoosh and the doing the swingy swings and it's... <laughs> the stunning animation for this grand final battle was helped in part by Small Boo Animation a husband and wife duo of animators whom I've talked a little bit about before in my video about the first two seasons of Amphibia, but they hella deserve a little more recognition for their efforts here too. Starting out from the humblest beginnings animating silly cartoons as far back as 2009, Alex and Lindsay have not only done work for shows like their Emmy Award winning episode of Adventure Time, but have also contributed their voices to independent works like the short film Here's the Plan by Fernanda Frick H and the web series Big Top Burger by Worthy Kids, which, if I may proselytize, is a constant absurdist delight. Back on Broadway yet again. The For watching and dreaming, they contributed some of the concept effects work on the way Bellos' slime would move and contaminate the environment, taking inspiration from the 1993 Super Mario Bros. movie, which... Well, at least that movie was good for something. Let's get out of here before this fungus stuff eats us alive! They also animated the many shots of the infection spreading across the aisles, calling to mind that trademark Miyazaki goobiness that you see in a number of his films. They, of course, also contributed to the aforementioned moments of Ida and King helping Luce with her magic, giving them that visual pop that makes me a blubbering mess every time I look at them. It's not only the action scenes they contributed to, they helped with some of the special character poses as well. Such as this ghibli-ass moment of Ida puffing up with pride when Luce reminds her mentor of one of the first lessons she taught her, about where a witch's magic comes from. from the heart. Or in the diabetes-inducing reunion between Ida and Rain, a scene they weren't even asked to do, yet at least one of them couldn't keep their hands off of. And bless them for it, honestly. While the Owl Weirdos go to confront Belos, the Hex Squad are still scrambling to save the dollified witches and demons as the archives start to deteriorate. The Collector narrowly saving them all, even as their infection grows at a worrying rate. In the throne room, Luce bum rushes Belos once more with our good friend Tom Barkle returning to provide some of the animation for their final confrontation. Ever implacable, Belos coldly tells Luce he can't be beaten, to which she replies with a panted mantra. She isn't going to let herself be burdened by his manipulation any longer, nor will she continue to allow her mistakes to bring her down. For she is the goddamn good witch Luce, badass child of the human realm, gangster student of the demon realm, and a mother -fucking, I may be paraphrasing a little, warrior of peace. Now eat this, sucker! <laughs> With this impromptu open heart surgery done, the muck monster and its malice quickly vanishes without a trace. The Isles finally returning to their regular, creepy, beautiful old self. Belos too returns to his regular, creepy, bastard old self, in what even he must know is a bullshit last-ditch effort to try and save his own skin.
I, I was I was cursed with a terrible, terrible sickness by by dark magic, just like your mentor. Someone drove a hot dog shaped car <laughs> through the window. Whose car is this? Yeah, come on. Whoever did this, just confess. We promise we won't be mad. Predictably, Luce is having none of it, summoning some boiling rain to wipe the egg off his face. Bellos desperately pleading to her that she'll be no better than those witches if she doesn't help him. We're human. We're better than this! Well, we ain't! <laughs> and so the wretched Emperor's reign ends not in some grand explosion of light or defiant last stand, but with him as the pathetic, sniveling slug he always was. Beyond forgiveness and beyond redemption. Doomed to fade to obscurity as a black mark on history that everyone would rather forget. And honestly, even that's way more than he deserves. What did I do to deserve this? I mean, what specifically? Of all the episodes in season three, watching and dreaming probably had the most going against it. Not only did it have to wrap up several arcs and turn the characterization of the Collector around when we'd practically only just met them an episode prior, but it also had to act as a satisfying conclusion to the overarching themes, arcs, and conflict of the entire show. As such, and owing to the nature of how the shortened season came to be, a lot of moments fans might have liked to see had to either be really rushed or neglected altogether. Bad Queen favor, what Bad Queen favor? In a perfect world, we might have gotten a finale where the rest of the Hex Squad and Camilla got a little more to do besides be support. And maybe even a little more time to truly relish in the reunion of the original Owl Gang. And hell, Hootie may even get a line. We could talk for hours, and hours, and hours, and hours, and hours, and hours. But for how high the odds were against them, the Owl crew still made one of the most gratifying final battles I've seen in any show, let alone Disney Channel show. Given that Luce's affection for the Boiling Isles began with Ida and King, it's only fitting that she should spend the majority of the finale with them, fighting by their side to defend their home from Belos's influence, the way they've been fighting back against his authoritarian and dogmatic design from the very start and being able to bring the Collector into their fold by appealing to the lost child looking for a friend, the same way all of them were lost and looking for a place to belong. It may be predictably rushed, but it's no less fitting to the core theme of the show and the reason why so many young and old lost souls were drawn to it. That feeling of camaraderie, support, friendship, love. Even as the dust settles and there's still so much work to do regarding setting things right for the future of their world, you get that infectious feeling of hope knowing that as long as they all work together, these weirdos just may be able to not only make things right, but even better than before. And so, with the many heartfelt reunions shared and awkward introductions made, we're left with a sense of immense satisfaction in where all of our unlikely heroes have ended up. How they've learned to forgive themselves for their mistakes and grow past their trauma. To turn what many saw as their weaknesses into strengths and to mature well beyond some of their years. It seems that everything has resolved into one neat and tidy package, except for one small realization that Luce discovers. With the Titan truly gone, so too are his glyphs rendered null. Her tried and true method of casting magic no longer works, effectively ending her prospective career as a witch before it could even begin. And that's the end. Goodbye. No, 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 of course that's not where it ends. But there's one last thing I have to do before we get to the true ending first. Before we wrap everything up and bid the show a final adieu, I figured now was as good a time as any to take one last look at all the little things that couldn't really fit into their own dedicated sections. But as there isn't a whole lot of stuff in Season 3 I haven't already talked about, 
I instead figured now would be a pretty good time to make this hodgepodge about the show as a whole. Addressing some minor stuff in the last three episodes, but also talking about some things I neglected from seasons 1 and 2. As always, I'm gonna bounce around a lot of subjects in no particular order, so for those of you who are just listening to this video while you're doing other stuff, no judgment. I'll use this sound effect every time I switch topics. Alright, one last time. In the last two videos, I highlighted the vocal performances of the major players for the Owl House. Sarah Nicole Robles, Wendy Malick, Alex Hirsch, all those guys. As Season 3 doesn't introduce any new players to the field, I decided this would be a good opportunity to showcase some of the talent providing the supporting or incidental characters heard throughout the show. There are some real veteran voice acting legends like Steve Bloom as the captain in Season 2, Gray Griffin as multiple voices but most prominently Masha, Kevin Michael Richardson, Keith Ferguson, April Stewart, Felicia Day, Gary Anthony Williams, Robin Adkin Downs, Dee Bradley, This Generation's Frank Welker Baker. If I don't stop myself, I could just list off every voice actor I recognize who did even the smallest grunt work for background extra number 42 or something. I've always been fascinated with recognizing an actor's voice in the stuff I'm watching, ever since I was a kid. Even now, I like finding out if a voice that feels vaguely familiar somehow was from something else I really love. Such as when I found out Noshir Dalal, Gray Vernworth in Owl House, was also Charles Smith from Red Dead Redemption 2. Eee, Charles! Or when I can point out the many background characters that Dana Terrace herself has provided. Some are pretty obvious, some a little less so, but of course her magnum opus is what is basically her own author avatar throughout the series. Tanella Nosa? She's had a name this whole time? Even while I was doing research for this video, I was still making connections between the voice actors in this show and other works I might recognize them from. Such as Alex Lothar, the voice of the younger Philip Wittebane, whose name didn't ring a bell for the longest time but something finally clicked when I saw his face. Just a quick little Google search later and… oh, Black Mare. Wait, who did he play in that? Oh! I've often thought of doing one of those they also voiced type videos for Owl House, if the dozens upon hundreds of other fans haven't already beaten me to it. Because there's a lot of talent I recognize in this show, and seeing the range some of these folks are capable of will give you a whole other appreciation for voice acting. Again, the rest of the video could be three more hours of me praising all the voice actors and I hate having to pick and choose but I really have to move on for the futile hope that this video will be even a little bit shorter than the last one. Yeah, I've seen the word counter speaking time, I know what's up. Still, I can give a few specific shoutouts to some actors who have a bigger part to play in Season 3, and a few I missed before. First off, I have to give major props to Natalie Palamides, who voices teenage Ida in most of the flashbacks we see of her. And she is a dead ringer for the type of natural sass that permeates Wendy Malick's voice. If there's one thing I love when you have multiple actors playing a character at different ages, it's when a casting director is able to pick such a natural fit between an older and younger actor. When you get that synergy just right, these hills sing. Meow. Still got it. Yeah, I do kind of rule. Joining the cast in a larger capacity for season 3 is, of course, Elizabeth Grujon as Camila, who has always been pitch perfect even in her smallest appearances. But her expanded role as more or less the sixth ranger of the Hex Squad helps to flesh out her character even more and really sell that familiar feeling of a mom who is clearly exhausted trying to keep up with everything going on around her but is nothing but a bundle of support and comfort to all her kids. Doting on them, protecting them, giving them solid words of wisdom, even relying on them to give her advice, which is another stellar moment of character writing. When was the last time you saw a parent go to their kids' friends for advice about them? Again, would've could've should've and all that, but even if it was just for three episodes, having Grujon in an expanded capacity was a definite boon for season three as a whole. Whew, I never expected to be a mother of six. Frida Wolf's performance as the Collector in the previous season was much more forebodingly sinister in nearly every scene they were in, and that fit the ambiguous nature of the character very well. Once they got out and were able to let loose in the second season finale though, that's when the Collector and Wolf's performance really started to shine. 
It can be incredibly easy as an adult voicing a kid character to slip into a precocious disingenuousness. Like that voice you put on when you're imitating a really annoying kid you were stuck behind in line at the grocery store or something. Hey mama, I wanna get a three musketeer bar. You won't give me a three musketeer bar? If you don't give me a three musketeer bar, I'm gonna- <laughs> What the fuck? Wolf skirts that line with all the grace of an Olympic figure skater. Getting an ample amount of black comedy from how kid-like the collector is, even for his godlike terrifying power. But also capturing his tragic loneliness and the emptiness that comes from having all this power but no genuine connections to speak of. For how abrupt he was introduced, and how little time they had to flesh out his character in just two episodes, Frida Wolf's performance went a long way in turning my perspective around. And in the words of the great philosopher Todd Sanchez, that's what it's all about. Drag those back to the collection room, will ya? Kiss it, bye! To cap this section off, there's one more voice actor I wanted to mention for how out of left field their being here felt. Well, not entirely out of left field, they'd done a few minor roles in season 1, but were largely absent in season 2 for whatever reason. The actor I speak of being none other than Aaron Hansen as Papa Frickin' Titan. In hindsight, it's incredibly obvious that's his voice. Just a lot more… mellow than I'm used to. But the first time I watched the scene between him and Luce, I honestly couldn't recognize him. I mean, if you've seen even one episode of Game Grumps. What is it? Oh god! It's a <laughs> <f> what? <laughs> Jesus Christ! There's the old cynical take you see every so often with people who got popular on YouTube or the internet in general. That their popularity was the only reason they were hired for a particular project. There's a video by Sungwon Cho, aka ProZD, that talks about this from the perspective of a professional voice actor who happens to do YouTube on the side. Yeah, I think my hot take is that it doesn't matter where a voice actor's background is, if they're a YouTuber, an on-screen actor, whatever. What matters is, are they a good fit for the character? Are they portraying the character authentically? Like, is it a good performance? That's what should matter. And to invalidate someone like Aaron's talent, because they happen to be a popular YouTuber, is entirely unfair. Even the other roles he's had in Owl House all sound and feel completely different from one another. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I just needed a place to hide from the reams. Hum de diddle to pass the bridge, you must first solve my riddle! And Papa Titan is such a departure from the type of role you'd normally associate with Aaron's voice that it's really no wonder it tripped me up the first time I heard it. The soft and reassuring confidence, mixed with the laid-back vibe of a dad who wandered in at the right moment to give you some valid life advice while sipping a brewski. It is, objectively, very funny that someone whose bread and butter is yelling and saying stupid shit on YouTube was cast for such a chill role like this. But it speaks to Aaron's innate skills as a voice actor that he nailed it so beautifully. King? <laughs> no, but he does get his good looks from me. I pissed a cactus out my dick! <laughs> what does that even mean? Two characters that have slipped through the cracks of my analysis in the last two videos were ironically two of the more popular side characters in the fandom. Amity's older twin siblings, Edric and Emera whose first impression in the episode Lost in Language is one, or two, of the jerky older sibling kind, where they intentionally push Amity's buttons for a lark and escalate their pranks into trying to expose her diary for all of Hexide to see, all because Amity would tattletale to their parents whenever they skip class. Isn't that taking it a bit too far? No, see, we're her family. It's tough love. While most of their pranks before were harmless enough, this Mean Girls-esque public shaming is a little on the extreme side, so it's pretty welcome to see them trying to be a little nicer to Amity by their next appearance, just as she's making an effort to be nicer to Luce. And we all know where that leads. HA! GAY! As the show goes on, both Ed and Em demonstrate their support for Amity in a multitude of ways, helping her practice on the Titan's knee, helping her train Luce to face Grom, 
and oh so subtly implying they're well aware of the chemistry between the human and their sister, pre Lumity, and sorta of nudging them towards each other. Oh, <laughs> hey Ed, hey Em, picking up Amity? Nah, looks like you got that covered. Ugh. It's not until a little later where they both receive a little more personal development, giving up their concealment stones to help Amity during the Bonesboro Brawl episode. With Emra shown to be pretty adept at healing magic on top of her illusions, in order to treat her little sister between fights. Ed, on the other hand, feels a bit useless in comparison, finding himself wrapped up in Eden King's plan to brew up a truth-telling potion to use on Warden Wrath to find out more about the then-upcoming Day of Unity. Ed not only shows he has a knack for potions, but for beast-keeping as well, which was kind of hinted back when he and his siblings were on the knee with him taking in a little bat creature as a pet. Ed, give me the bat. No! If we're not gonna eat it, I wanna keep it as a pet! Get back here before that thing bites you! Again, they're mainly side characters, so they don't have a whole lot of on-screen development. But it's easy to see why they became so popular with fans. Their snarky and fun-loving attitude mixed with a genuine love for their sister, even when she annoys them or vice versa, helps to showcase a realistic portrayal of the ideal relationship between brothers and sisters, constantly pestering each other in all the things they do, yet ultimately ready to lend a hand when the chips are down. Nobody messes with family but family, after all. You're gonna hurt yourself! I don't care, I'm gonna hug my sister! I mentioned in the previous video that Ida and eventually Lilith's curse could be seen as a metaphor for mental or physical disabilities that people go through in their daily lives, an allegory that I was nowhere near the first to point out. There have been plenty of videos and testimonials from fans that analyze and praise the depiction of disabilities portrayed through the Owlbeast's curse, as well as the depictions of how magic or palismans are used to help characters like Bump through their physical impairments. Hunter and Luce also use unconventional magic, artificial and glyphs respectively, that can be compared to alternative learning methods neurodivergent kids use to help them excel where they might otherwise be left behind. All of this is well and good, but there's a few nuggets from Season 3 that help cement the idea that your disabilities, physical or mental, don't have to define you or hold you back. One thing I didn't really go into about Ida in particular is that during the events of the last season's finale, to prevent the draining spell from killing her, Rain actually removed Ida's branded arm just before the Collector intervened, and the rest of the show retains this loss, with Ida sporting a bandaged stump in the final two episodes, and, jumping ahead a bit, brandishing a hook after a time skip. It would be just as easy for the crew to give her back her hand through magic or give her a straight-up magic hand or something of the like, but nope. That sense of loss doesn't get tossed aside. That hand is gone for good. Which is more than I can say for a couple other shows out there. Breezy sucked! But, much like with her curse, that isn't portrayed as entirely a bad thing. Speaking anecdotally, my grandpa lost his right arm to cancer a few years before I was born. Yet for how well he lived his life afterward, it almost seemed like he was always one-armed and left-handed from my perspective. Like, he would drive around the hilly roads of Southern California literally one-handed, and if the anecdotes of my family are to be believed, he would sometimes answer calls from his car while driving with his knees. For the record, I do not condone this, you should never try it, but it is badass. The show never pretends like living with these disabilities is a cakewalk. The negative aspects are explored pretty thoroughly for most of the first season and a half. But jumping the gun a little bit more, by the time of the epilogue, neither Ida or Lilith are shown to be rid of their curses. Sure, they still can't cast natural magic, but neither of them appear to be worse off for it. Lilith has even been able to conjure her own harpy form. There are always going to be downsides to a physical or mental disability. Life can't be perfect, even for supposed neurotypicals. But if a person or child's needs are met, and they're able to grow in a supportive environment, then it makes the journey a little easier. I mean, I was diagnosed with autism when I was three, and look at me now! Shut up.
In contrast to the prominent evolution of Luce and Amity's journey from friends to dress up and travel buddies, you have the much more low-key relationship between Hunter and Willow, who form an almost immediate connection during the, regrettably, only Willow-centric episode of Season 2. Woo, yeah, go Willow! Willow's character growth from shrinking Violet to blooming perennial was already great on its own, but it pairs especially well with Hunter's arc throughout Season 2 who puts up a charade as a new student to Hexide during the events of this episode, joining Willow's fledgling flyer derby team as more or less a self-given challenge to prove himself as not just a nepotism baby. And while initially reticent around her, he easily opens up once she and the rest of the team show how each of them are not to be underestimated. And it's both of their inner doubts regarding themselves as half a witch that truly sparks an unspoken connection. Especially if you're considered half a witch like me. I'm just half a witch Willow. The rest of their bonding is mostly implied, as it's suggested Hunter may have added Willow onto his new Pentagram account. And the next time he sees what he thinks is his captain, he blushes. He blushes around her quite a lot, actually. The advanced friendship appears to be mutual, with Willow eager to rush after who she believes to be Hunter when he's taken by Kikimura back to the Emperor's castle in the penultimate episode of Season 2, and her casually flirting with him when he shows off his makeshift O'Bailey costume in thanks to them. I'm gonna borrow that book when you're done with it. There's never any overt declaration of mutual attraction or even anything beyond tiny blushes or pinky holding, but here's the thing. Come here. No, no, get close. Do you not understand how cute they are? Oh my god, they are so pure, I can't believe it! It's honestly kind of refreshing how low-key all the romantic relationships in Owl House are. Even Lumity when you compare it to other main couples in most media. This, again, probably has to do with Dana Terra saying romance was never going to be a huge focus in the show's writing. And that ultimately makes these little moments between the major couples of the show so... wholesome. Like, I know this mini-section is supposed to be about Hunlo, or winter, if you prefer. But look at this little moment between Ida and Rain after the dust has settled in Watching and Dreaming. I have seen entire romantic movies where the main couple isn't as convincing in two hours as these two are in this one scene. It's f***ing ridiculous how cute this is. There's really not much else to Willow and Hunter's relationship that makes me like it so much. It's just a great dynamic between characters who have endured a similar trauma bringing out the best in each other because of that shared experience. Broken people making each other better. It's good stuff. Thanks for what you said back there. You mean a lot to me too. <laughs> oh, Amazing! I'm shocked it only took three seasons! You know what's not very low-key in season three, though? I said I wasn't gonna bring up the corporate bullshit side of things too much in this video, and I intend to stick with that promise. Even though there's plenty I could still say, believe me. Capitalism! Where everyone wins, except you. But one corporate BS that's always worth pointing out is the fact that a number of prominent LGBTQ plus moments in the Owl House often find themselves censored in overseas markets, owing to the more openly homophobic nature of certain governments. Possibly in response to this, the Owl Crew have certainly gotten a lot bolder in how it presents a number of gay moments in Season 3. From Luce's PowerPoint presentation to her mom where she comes out officially as bi, the pride stickers in the photo album Willow makes, and Masha's name tag and nail polish explicitly coding them as non-binary. You can call these moments cringe or say they lack subtlety, but here's the thing. Even just a few years ago, a show's crew would get immense pushback for even the slightest bit of inclusion. I keep going back to it in every Owl House vid I make, but think of the episode of Gravity Falls where they had to swap out two old ladies for a more heteronormative couple, or how they had to hide the relationship between two gay cops and pass it off as them either being weird for a joke or just being buddies. Hell, Steven Universe, one of the gayest f***ing shows ever made, faced its own overseas censorship in the relationship between Ruby and Sapphire, with a few countries cutting around various clips of their PDA, rewriting certain lines to tone down their blatant sapphicness, and Cartoon Network themselves outright cancelling the original run when Rebecca Sugar wouldn't back down from their plan to give them an out-and-out, har-har, wedding. 
So yeah, I'm inclined to give the Owl Crew the benefit of the doubt when I see more blatant examples of representation like this. Because, after a certain point, subtlety will only get you so far. If we have to scream in people's ears or show off huge bisexual flags to get them to acknowledge that gay or trans or non-binary people exist, then so fucking be it. Another character who slipped past my all-seeing analytical eye was everyone's favorite little lickspittle, Kiki Mora. Mother God! I don't care! I hate her! I hate it! since season one! Like many characters in the show, Kiki Mora goes on quite the interesting journey as the seasons go on. From prim and imposing major domo, to paranoid and murderous opportunist, to trying to take over a public high school. You know, actually, that kind of tracks. Much too good for children. Watching Kikimura slowly but surely degrade from this enigmatic figurehead of the Emperor's Coven to having a pissing competition with a 16-year-old Um, phrasing? was honestly the only type of spiral a character like this could have. Someone whose life revolves around their position and how much power they have. And when anything threatens that power, be that the Emperor's nephew or just a handful of children, she'll go to the most extreme lengths she can to snuff them out, and cling to her sense of duty and position like a blanket. Ah! Ah! My blanket! My blue blanket! Give me my blue blanket! <laughs> Even when she threatens to have a small moment of humanization, so to speak, during the Coven Day Parade episode in Season 2, where she admits to Luce through tears that she has to choose between attending a family reunion at Palm Stings eh, cute, and maintaining her role in the parade. She almost immediately throws any sentimentality she had out the window upon hearing Terra's Snapdragon say she was being considered for a promotion. Palm Stings can burn for all I care! You heard Terra, they want to promote me! ME! There's a little more to it than just that, and again, there's a couple videos by Jamjar Works that go into Kikimura's characterization in a slightly nicer light than what I just did. But please, don't take me ragging on Kikimura to mean I dislike her or even hate her. Far from it. I actually love how deranged and petty she gets as the show goes on. I can see how these qualities and her staunch refusal to do some introspection about her place in the Emperor's Coven. Am I so out of touch? No, it's the children who are wrong. Would drive someone to dislike or even hate her. But to me, I like that she remains a mostly stagnant antagonistic character with rare shades of something deeper. Similar to how Basha remains a bully archetype for most of the show. You could even say that Kikimura is to Lilith what Basha is to Amity. Someone who had the chance to see the error of their ways through the reformation of a former like-minded individual, but was more interested in preserving the status quo because of their status in it. This is probably the reason we see Kikimura align herself with Basha in For the Future, taking advantage of Basha's heightened anxiety and desperation to cling to her old life in the wake of the apocalypse, using it to start her own empire. Well, her own empire based heavily off of Belos's anyway. She's just copying Bellus's scare people into worship thing because she has no ideas of her own. One other kind of specific thing. I always find it incredibly funny when a character is apparently so great at disguising themselves that no one can recognize them, despite them doing the absolute bare minimum. Guys, I know you've been gone for the last couple months, but come on! It is a disguise, you fool, can't you see? Huh. Alternatively, Kikimura was just so forgettable in her role as Bellus' assistant that no one in Hexide can point out the obvious. And that's also freaking hysterical. As for you, Roka, I know there's been nothing but chemistry between us. Be that as it may, I- That's a robot, Matt. Okay, this is just a brief throwaway gag I got a good chuckle out of during my last rewatch, but I gotta mention it here. In the episode Escape of the Palisman, as King tries to usher Luce out of the Owl House so he can use the Owl Beast to go get some revenge on a kid at the playground, this happens. I'll be back soon. Close call. What? Nothing. Oh, okay. <laughs> that just tickles me so much. Season 1 is still pretty great. Another supporting character that deserves a quick shout out is probably the most recurring named scout in the Emperor's Coven. Steve... Tholomew, I guess. Steve! 
starting off as a randomly named background extra for a joke. Steve made a few recurring appearances in Season 1, and would get a smidgen more fleshed out when he returned in Season 2, commenting to Hunter that he doesn't envy the torment his teammates will have to endure when they're actually put into the Emperor's Coven. And of course, Bellus likes to collect everyone's palacemen. Steve is beginning to regret his choices. This starts Steve's mostly off-screen journey of self-discovery, realizing long before his road trip with King that he doesn't want to be a faceless stooge in Bellos' army anymore, helping the little guy through his own crisis of identity in the process. His genuine friendship with Lilith, where he shows up to support her even after she's been ostracized from the coven, and the fact that he has a shirt with his own name on it, really helped Steve stand out amidst a sea of faceless goons, and helped him find his own face because of it. I don't want people to see me as a big scary monster anymore. Me neither. There's a pretty amusing throwaway line in the very first episode of the show, where Ida talks about how all the mythological creatures we have in the human realm are based on real creatures in the demon realm such as griffins, vampires, or giraffes. Giraffes? Oh yeah, we banish those guys. A bunch of freaks. This is a funny line in and of itself, because if you've ever seen a giraffe in person or in a video, yeah. Come to find in Season 3, when the Hex Squad inevitably go see a giraffe at the local zoo, there's a pretty good reason they banished those f***ers way back when. I didn't bring up Via a whole lot while I was talking about thanks to them, mainly because she doesn't really contribute to the major thematic arcs Luce and Hunter go through. But that doesn't mean her slightly expanded presence wasn't greatly appreciated. Through the montage showing what the kids have got up to in the early months of their stay in the human realm, we see how naturally V fits in with the group, and how she even chooses her own human form to properly blend in now that Luce is back. And while her time with Camila was largely off-screen, we get little moments that reflect how their proper mother-daughter relationship must have grown, with V showing a mastery of Spanish as the kids all practice through a familiar creepy bird app. Tres tristes tigres comen en tres tristes plazos de trigo. Perfecto! And there's even a cute little message that V and Camila left for Luce to welcome her home, which I'm assuming they must have had ready for her the month or so between yesterday's lie and thanks to them. And while she's largely separate from Luce or Hunter's character arcs, that doesn't stop her from having her own moment of growth when the journey to find Titan's blood ends up with no leads, resigning V to take them all to the museum, where she obviously had a pretty bad experience the last time she was there. Fortunately, the old caretaker has long since been fired, and while Masha may not recognize V thanks to her new glamour, there's still an immediate connection that's incredibly sweet to see. If you ever need a tour guide, hit me up. It's a bit of a shame V didn't go back with them so she could be in the season a little more, maybe even get some vengeance of her own against Belos. But it also makes sense from a character writing perspective that she wouldn't quite be ready to go back to the land that emotionally, and probably physically, scarred her just yet. Either way, seeing V live her best life and be truly accepted by the Nacetas like the daughter or sibling they always had, is absolutely wonderful considering all the hardships she's faced up to this point. Voy a recoger a luz de la escuela. Muy bueno! Keep it up! I feel the need to shout out composer Brad Breek again not only because of his stellar work for seasons 2 and 3, but because as I was re-watching the show, I noticed several recurring leitmotifs for certain characters. Some of these leitmotifs were carried over, expanded, and or tweaked upon from T.J. Hill's work on the first season, such as with Bellos's subdued theme. Now, I'm not much of a music guy, so I couldn't really point out the specific instruments or timing these pieces use, but I am 90% certain that Breek's variation of Bellos's theme subtly gives away the twist that he's actually Philip Wittebane if you really listen for it. Like, I know this may get me in trouble with YouTube's trigger-happy copyright claims, but Listen to this. <music> Philip 
Philip's music is just a sped up version of Bellos's, right? If that is the case, then it's a super impressive clue hidden right in front of the audience's face. It's sort of like the episode Perchance to Dream from Batman the Animated Series, where, if you're familiar with the leitmotifs associated with certain Batman villains, you can guess who the main antagonist of that episode is before they even reveal themselves. Again, not much of a music guy, but if someone more musically inclined could validate me here in the comments, that'd be great. This kind of specific character theming pops up all over the second season. You have Rain's Rhapsody showing up as both their character theme and the theme of theirs and Ida's relationship as a whole. King has some great tribal sounding instruments for his new theme that almost has a Majora's Mask Woodfall Temple vibe. And the Collector's theme is an absolute bop I can never get out of my head, nor do I wish to. I mentioned it in the last video, but I'll do it again here. Brad Breek has released most of the musical compositions he did for Owl House on his YouTube channel, and his co-composer, Composer? No, that's just composer. Andrew Morgan Smith has done the same for two out of three season three episodes. I'll also repeat myself in saying that music composition in general for TV is often overlooked. Some of these recurring themes didn't even register for me until I was re-watching the show, which is kind of indicative of how a lot of the work of a TV show's crew as a whole can be overshadowed by the end result. Which is sort of what you want to happen when you're making a show or movie or what have you. For the audience to forget that someone made this, and feel immersed in this world as if you were truly looking through a magical portal onto other worlds and other people's lives. Suff. Suff. Still, it does kind of suck that even in my last two videos, I didn't really shout out the crew as much as I probably should have. Which leads us to... In the video I, eventually, made about Amphibia's final season, I shouted out a couple storyboarders and special animators who aided in the Madcap series finale, but even that kind of felt insubstantial in hindsight. Granted, if I'd read out a list of every crew member who worked on Amphibia or Owl House, then the videos would be, like, 50 hours long, and I don't think anybody wants that, least of all me. Still, as this is more than likely the last big video I'll make about the Owl House, barring any more specials or spin-offs anyway. Did you know Lilith was her captain? Really? Now that's a spin-off I'd watch. I wanted to dedicate some time to shouting out a lot more of the crew who helped make this show possible. Be they staff who were there from beginning to end, or those who were more specific to one or two seasons. I'm not entirely sure how organized this will end up being by the end, so let's just dive right in, shall we? During my latest rewatch of the entire series, I kept an extensive Google Doc of crew names and which episodes they worked on. And let me tell you, when you actually start to pay attention to some of the names of the crew on the shows you love, you go on whole journeys of parasocial pride with people you've never even met. There are a number of people who seem to have received little promotions, for lack of a better word, as the show went on. Like frequent Season 1 storyboarder Bo Coburn, becoming an episode director in Seasons 2 and 3. Or apprentice-slash-assistant writer Madeline Hernandez, who joined the crew in late Season 1. Going on to co-write the teleplays for the first two episodes of Season 3, and Hollow Frickin' Mind, which was her debut co-writing credit. What a banger of an episode to be your debut writing credit, hot damn. There's also little things you notice, like department titles merging or changing entirely between episodes, and sometimes a crew member's name changing at that. Again, I'm not trying to be weird pointing all this out. I'm just trying to illustrate the different experience I had through keeping track of all these names, as opposed to just letting the credits scroll by and only really paying attention to which actor played which character. Shouting out a few crew members from the first season, we have none other than Steven Sugar to thank for much of the feel of the Boiling Isles as a whole, as he served as the lead location designer for the entirety of season one. Steven Sugar, of course, being the brother of Rebecca Sugar, and the namesake for their flagship show, Steven Universe, though I could have sworn it was Sally Galaxy at one point. He's only credited for Season 1, but on his website you can actually see a few backgrounds specific to Season 2. 
I'm not sure why he wasn't credited for season two, though Dana Terrace mentioned that Disney TV can be a bit cagey about out of house animators and crew members, so maybe that was a factor, but don't quote me on that. In any case, he and the rest of the background team did amazing work in bringing the disgusting and beautiful landscapes of the Boiling Isles to life. Talented artists like Jane Bach, who is credited for every episode in season one and most of season two, Ryan Andrews, Killian Ning, Ren Farron, Leonard Hung, Sarah Webb, like I keep saying, I could and desperately want to list off every storyboarder and every crew member to give proper credit where it's due. But even with that, it's often hard to pinpoint who exactly did what in a given episode, so I have to draw a line somewhere or we'd be here all day. It's fortunate then, that someone who came onto the show fairly late in its run, took to crediting as many members of the crew as possible on their Twitter account for even the slightest bit of background work. I speak of production associate Rebecca Boza, aka Rebecca Rose, formerly of YouTube. Like many others, I discovered her channel fairly early into the show's run, where she would not only post her video reactions to each episode, but also go over the secret codes hidden in Season 1, and recap with some in-depth analysis and possible clues as to where the show was heading. She was basically the Vati Vidya of the Owl House fandom for a hot minute. And it was beyond awesome when she announced in December 2021 that she had become a production associate for the show, her first named credit appearing in Edge of the World. She would obviously become too busy to keep up with her YouTube channel, but she would still go out of her way to credit a few names of the crew members and recognize their work as the show went on, pointing out guest animators and color designers alike, positions that you normally wouldn't think twice about from a general audience's perspective. And that's not a diss from me. I was one of those general audience members who didn't pay much attention to these names even when people like Boza would point them out. It honestly kind of reminds me of that scene from early on in Ratatouille, where Remy goes over the different people and their positions in the kitchen, glibly passing over Linguini's presence because he's just the garbage boy. He's not that important to the kitchen, right? Looking at all these names and all the departments they're in, even someone who did credited work for only one episode in the show is important in the grand scheme of it all. Even the production assistants like Boza, Lindsay Diamond, Janae Hall, or interns like Austin Faber, Stephanie Snyder, Cheryl Yap, and Leo Guevara play an important if overlooked part to how each episode of the show progresses from start to finish. It truly takes a village to make even the simplest 20 minute episode of television that you can think of. Like, I guarantee, even if there was an episode of The Owl House where the characters sat in a circle in one room for the entire runtime, and there were minimal camera angles, backgrounds, and dialogue, it would still be an absolute mad dash to the finish line, especially during the height of the pandemic. At any rate, if you want even more crew names than I can possibly mention, then you should take a scroll down Boza's media page on her Twitter. That is, assuming Twitter will even still be around by the time I release this. Where not only will you get those names, you'll also see the little cameos the crew members have in episodes 1 and 3 of season 3. Like Man of Many Hats Steven Sandoval as Luce's teacher, Mike Austin and Bridget Underwood, Jason Everazito, Matthew Cousin, and many, many, many more. One other thing about when you actually pay attention to crew names, you can actually recognize some shared crew members between Owl House and its sister show Amphibia. I'm sure a lot of crew members from DTVA bounce around the various Disney Channel or XD shows all the time, but it was still pretty fun to recognize a couple of names as I was rewatching the show, such as Imbal Breda, a storyboard artist from seasons 2 and 3 of Amphibia, who has a few storyboard credits for season 1 as well as some storyboard revisions and additional storyboarding credit for thanks to them. There's also Andy Garner Flexner, Owl House's art director who started sharing the position with Season 1's AD Ricky Cometa around the midpoint of Season 2, before becoming the sole art director for Season 3. On Amphibia, he was a color designer who was eventually promoted to lead color design in several Season 3 episodes, including the show's finale. There's probably plenty more shared names I'd recognize if I went as in-depth on Amphibia's crew as I did with Owl House's, 
And that's another reason why I kinda regret not going whole hog for that <gasps> Joe Sparrow! On the subject of shared crew members, it's worth pointing out the dialogue director for Owl House and Amphibia, Eden Rigel, an accomplished actress on and off screen in her own right. Her career spans at least three decades, and is equally filled with smaller incidental roles in shows or video games, and more major roles, such as her near 13 year long stint on the soap opera All My Children. Are soap operas even a thing anymore? I'm legit curious, but not enough to Google it. She seems to have caught the dialogue direction bug sometime in the late 2010s, with Amphibia being her first credit. Voice direction in general is another position that's all too easy to overlook. Yet, without a really strong vocal director giving you feedback and challenging you to bring out your best performance, a character's delivery can often fall flat on its face. <laughs> the go-to person that always comes to my mind when I think about this is Andrea Romano, an absolute legend in the industry, who was the voice director for shows like Animaniacs, Batman the Animated Series, The Boondocks, Justice League and Justice League Unlimited, and Avatar The Last Airbender. These shows are all filled to the brim with great vocal talent, and all of them will continually sing the praises of Romano any chance they get. The same is very much true for how the cast of Owl House will talk about Eden Rigel as their dialogue director. Think about the timing of the jokes, the really dramatic moments, and especially the hardcore emotional scenes throughout the show. Alex Hirsch has mentioned that he's never had to cry as much as he had to for King in season 2 especially. And if you've taken even a cursory course in acting or been involved in high school theater, if you're not giving your absolute all for a crying scene, then the audience can tell you're faking it. And Alex Hirsch is a very talented man, but acting while crying isn't easy in the slightest. You can only bring out the heart of a scene like this when you have a great coach to dig that heart out of you whether you like it or not. Don't give up, Nate! We're gonna get that demon out of you! Even if it takes all night! It also helps that the actors in Rigel had a great story and script to work off of. If you're like me and are a complete noob when it comes to the way shows work, then you might be wondering why story and written credits are often separate, and why certain people may be credited for one but not the other. This is actually pretty simple. According to the Television Credits Manual by the Writers Guild of America, the most recent copy I could find being from 2010, a story by credit is for writers who came up with the basic outline for a given episode, involving character development, themes, or plot progression. Whereas a written by or teleplay by credit are for the writers who develop the actual script of an episode, including dialogue, character action, camera angles, and so on. The difference between teleplay and written credits for a given show is that a teleplay is often based on another writer's work or outline, while a written by credit implies the writer themselves came up with the concept based on the original story ideas. Much of the crew credited as staff or story writers also wrote many of the episodes of Owl House. And just as it's always fun to try and find a specific storyboard artist's style in more storyboard-driven shows, it's always fun to try and find a writer's signature in an episode's script where, even if you didn't know they'd written it, you could probably still tell. The easiest example by far was with Molly Knox Ostertag, a staff writer for season 1 and the first half of season 2, whose written by credits include two of the gayest episodes in season 1. Hell, even her story by credits include episodes like Understanding Willow, through the Looking Glass Ruins, and Knock Knock Knockin' on Hootie's Door. I can't definitively say what she did or didn't write in any of those scripts or outlines, but if she was involved in an episode, there was a pretty good chance it was gonna be super savic. Me? On a team with you? <laughs> Running around in cute uniforms? <laughs> Sweating? I gotta go! And, at the risk of spoiling the epilogue a little bit, it's worth mentioning that as the credits go by, we see plenty other cameos from many other crew members on the show, including a likeness from Dana Terrace herself. 
and we get a complete staff list of the animation studio that made all of Season 3 and much of the preceding episodes of Owl House possible. Sugar Cube A South Korean animation studio, Sugar Cube's resume mostly consists of shows for Disney television, including 54 episodes of Star vs. the Forces of Evil and 33 for Big City Greens. Alongside Sunman Image Pictures and Rough Draft Korea, Sugar Cube has been animating The Owl House ever since Season 1, producing the lion's share of episodes, including the intros to Seasons 1 and 2, and the Owl Pellet shorts. Serum Animation's team got individual credits for their work on Amphibia's series finale, so I'm very glad to see The Owl House continue this trend. Again, even if the finale had been a nice little tea party where barely anyone moved for 50 minutes, I would still be happy to see all these people credited for their work, especially since individual credits for overseas studios is rare as it is. I really do wish I could spend hours upon hours gushing about all the incredible work everyone on this show did, but like I said, you do have to draw a line in the sand somewhere so your video doesn't just prattle along endlessly. I'll probably link to the Google Doc I made with all the crew names in the video description, so that anyone who's interested in doing their own research can do so to their heart's content. Because when you get a glimpse of even a fraction of the talent on display here, you'll probably end up walking away with a newfound appreciation for just how hard it is to make a story like this come to life. Even for all the talented artists and writers who stuck with the show for the long haul, came on a bit later, left after one season or even just one episode. The work everyone put into this is nothing short of amazing. Regardless of any shortcomings you may find with the story or characters or what have you, I could talk a little more about some of the would've, should've, could'ves I personally have with this show, but the crew suffered enough misfortune. If I can instead prop them up even a little more with this video, I'll gladly do so. No cons here, Owl Lady. Only pros. But hey, if someone can tell me who on the prop design team hit all these Soulborn references in the background of a few Season 1 episodes, hit me up. I need to know who the f***ing nerd is. I've been wondering for like, three years. Let the blood of your enemies take you strength! <laughs> As we approach the end of this final hodgepodge, I thought it would be fun to list off some of my personal favorite episodes from each season, in an arbitrary top 5 list that could shift and change depending on a multitude of circumstances, but people seem to like arbitrary top 5 lists on the internet, so what the hell. These are the top 5 episodes from season 1 of Owl House the Film Freaks. Yeah, I forgot to put my name in there, didn't I? List! Number 5. Convention. A pretty fun episode that introduces, among other things, the Coven System, the Emperor's Coven, the shadier side of the Coven System and Emperor's Coven, Lilith, and shows Amity's softer side after her initial impression as the typical alpha bully in other shows like this. It sets up some pretty compelling character arcs for the rest of the season, and has that kick-ass witch's duel by Spencer Wan at the end. What else can you say? Number 4. Wing It Like Witches The Calm Before the Storm. You could argue this episode is sort of the last truly light-hearted misadventure of the show, as even Season 2's misadventures more often than not tie into the overarching plot of the Day of Unity, or the Mystery of the Titans. As such, Witches has plenty of great comedy, a legitimately invigorating sport, and Amity at absolute peak gay disaster levels following her deepening crush on Moose. What's not to love? And scoop! <laughs> oh, wow, sports! Number 3. Agony of a Witch Season 1 still has a bit of a split reaction from those who enjoy what it was setting up, and those who think it was too trodden down with cliches and slow world building. I won't deny, rewatching it was a bit of a challenge knowing how good the show gets in Season 2. But if nothing else, Agony of a Witch is the perfect preview for just how great this show was gonna become. The first appearance of Emperor Bellos, and the watered-down lore the Coven tells about him, 
The even better witch's duel, once again courtesy of Spencer Wan. And especially that jaw-dropping reveal of Lilith being the one who cursed Ida, sending the entire fanbase on a cancel Lilith crusade. If you weren't there when this episode dropped, you'll never truly know, buddy. Number 2. Witches Before Wizards Might be a controversial choice putting this so close to the top, but if episode 1 followed the it's okay to be different message to an almost hackneyed degree, Witches Before Wizards showed how the Owl House could take a pretty trite setup and subvert it to great effect. The twist is easily telegraphed, even the show makes no attempts to play it for a genuine surprise. But the reveal still has an air of effective creepiness. And the overall message that rather than waiting for a prophecy to tell you you're special, you should go out and carve your own destiny, is one that carried the show and many of its characters to the finale. It's probably not the most popular of episodes, but it hooked me on the show in particular, so that counts for a lot in my book. Number 1. Enchanting Grom Fright Daring today, aren't we? To say that this episode is where the show truly took off would probably be an understatement. My wife often equates it to Jailbreak from Steven Universe, where there was a definite shift in the fanbase from reasonably popular to OH MY GOD YOU HAVE TO WATCH THIS SHOW IT'S THE BEST THING EVER! <laughs> what was that? <laughs> the more cynical among you will probably chalk this up to just the sapphic representation on display. And I won't deny that probably played a big part in getting more people to watch post-Grom. But I'll also say that's way more of a bonus than a detriment. It introduced many young people to characters that looked like them, felt like them, loved like them. It got people hooked onto a show that would explore much deeper themes regarding parental abandonment, ostracization from society due to a physical or mental illness or by not conforming to what an oppressive system pushes them to believe. It's hardly a wonder why many LGBTQ fans were driven to the show, even after Gromfright. But the episode itself was a great hook to introduce new viewers, and a fun episode in its own right for those who had been watching since the start. Fun character moments, spectacular animation, a sense that the status quo had been forever changed with just a simple note. I keep saying it, but... You really had to be there, dude. You really had to be there. And now, the top five episodes of- You know what, I'm not doing that whole thing again. Season two, top five. Number five. Them's the breaks, kid. Quite possibly the last lighthearted episode in the entire show. Them's the Breaks Kid is an extended flashback sequence about a young Ida and her first meeting with Rain. A prequel spin-off involving Ida's school years before she was cursed has always been a popular idea among the fanbase. So to see it in action, even for just one episode, was a real treat. Owl House Babies win Disney! Number 4. Reaching Out What could have been another comedic sports episode, is given a much deeper throughline with both Amity and Luce dealing with their own respective paternal issues, with the former desperately trying to be seen and understood, and the latter trying desperately to forget the significance this particular day has. While there's plenty of great action and character moments besides the emotional climax, wherein Luce comes clean about her dad, it really is that scene that makes this episode for me. And learning that Dana Terrace lost her own dad at a fairly young age, you can kind of see why this moment resonates as much as it does. The emotion has a realness to it that only comes from experiencing that deeply personal loss yourself, making for a very powerful and tear-jerking episode. Number 3. Clouds on the Horizon and King's Tide Yes, I'm cheating by counting two episodes at once, but the season 2 finale is basically the two-parter finale I always want from these kinds of shows, with one half focusing on the micro-conflict of Amity's parents, and the other being the macro-conflict of Belos' terrible grand scheme finally coming to fruition. I've said it before, but I'll say it again. Even as I was re-watching for what must be the third or fourth time, I was still hit with that gut excitement of what was gonna happen next. 
through each terrible moment the characters endured and each awful setback in their plans. It's quite possibly one of the best season finales I have ever seen from a Disney show, and sets up the stakes for season 3 masterfully. So who cares if I'm cheating? These episodes are the shit and you're not gonna make me decide between them. Nyeh, nyeh, nyeh. Number 2. Hollow Mind An absolute powerhouse of an episode, Hollow Mind shows the unabridged backstory of Belos' rise to power, and the in-universe reveal of his true name to Luce, as well as Hunter's true status as a Grimwalker. Though you do end up wishing in hindsight that Luce had bothered to explore just a few more of the portraits in the background before the big reveal, and get some juicy backstory that's only vaguely implied later on. The snippets we do see fire the darker recesses of the imagination, with some of the most diabolical writing and animation for Belos yet, as he drops all pretenses and shows what a manipulating bastard he's been all along. Honestly, the entire climax is one of the darkest moments I've ever seen on a Disney Channel show, easily usurped later on by the events of the Day of Unity, sure, but the truly sinister writing and animation for this scene helps it stand out as one of the show's absolute best moments, and is a great reminder of just how dark Disney can get when the right people aren't afraid to show just a little realness in their villains. <laughs> Number 1. Knock Knock Knockin' on Hootie's Door I had an entire section dedicated to this episode in the last video I made about the Owl House, so refer to that if you want a little more detail. But I'm being completely serious when I say this episode as a whole is one of the strongest, if not THE strongest, in the whole show. It doesn't necessarily forward the plot or anything, but the dedicated character moments in each of the three segments, and how the status quo so drastically changes for each of them. For something a lot of fans wrote off as filler when they first saw the title and read the synopsis. To become quite possibly the most important episode of the show thus far. You gotta respect that hootie hustle. And the top three episodes of season three are... Um... And three, two, one. Okay, let's wrap this up. Considering the last video I made spent the entire final section waxing poetic about the bittersweet nature of endings, I thought it best not to repeat myself too heavily when talking about the conclusion of Owl House. Especially when you take into account how overall happy the epilogue for Owl House is. It was a running gag in the fandom that the ending would emotionally shatter everyone in some way or another, thanks in part to an offhand statement where Dana Terrace mentioned she hates happily ever after in a stream some years back. Everyone lives happily ever after. <sighs> yeah. Gradually morphing into Dana hates happy endings, plus the general vibe of suffering the show had built up throughout season two especially. Hell, even Eden Rigel mentioned during a cast and crew Q&A. Dana loves pain, you know, I think she must. <laughs> However, not unlike other fantasy stories for kids that delve into some pretty heavy subject matter, the ending not only leaves the characters with a satisfying sense of closure, it manages to leave the audience feeling brighter for having endured so much pain. Where we're rewarded in seeing the struggles of characters like Willow or Hunter, by seeing the paths they've chosen, and the people they've become by accepting the flaws in themselves, and forging a strong connection because of them. The steadfast dedication with Amity or Gus, who may have had crippling identity crises at the crossroads of their lives, but are now pursuing their passions without anyone holding them back. The elation of the Clawthorn sisters, who have learned to live with their curses and use their trauma to help shape a new, better world for the next generation of witches and demons. And Luce, who had every right to despair upon the realization that she may never be able to practice magic again, pushing herself forward as she always did, not letting anyone tell her what she can do with her life and who she can be, 
to hell with the supposed limitations. Remind me, what major did you pick again? Come on, Mama. You know me. I picked all of them. <laughs> yes, it seems this ending as a whole is much more outwardly cheerful when compared to some of the deepest fears the fandom had. Regarding whether or not beloved characters would die, or Luce would have to make the ultimate decision of which realm she wanted to live in. Hell, even the consequences of Belos's reign that seemed like they would be permanent, such as the coven brands the majority of which is war, are shown to be cured through the combined efforts of the healing and abomination coven remnants. And topping all that off, when Luce travels to the demon realm for a surprise and belated King Senyera, King reveals that as he's growing older, his latent power is growing stronger. Enough so that new glyphs are starting to appear, allowing Luce to practice magic once again. Everything's coming up roses for everybody in the best possible way. I can think of no better ending for all these characters whom I wanted to see safe and sound. And yet, I still can't help but feel... conflicted. Forgetting all the behind-the-scenes drama regarding Season 3, I think any ending this show had would ultimately give me and countless others this feeling. I'm really not trying to repeat myself, as I keep repeating, but that is the nature of endings at work again. The story could have the happiest ending imaginable, where everyone goes on to live long and eventful lives with the promise of new adventures around the corner. And yet the finality of it all. The sense that the story you've enjoyed so much is over. It leaves you with a forlorn sensation of... Now what? Another angle of my confliction probably comes from how much I owe the current state of my channel to the show and everyone who worked on it. I didn't set out to make an hour-long ode to Owl House's first season over three years ago. The original idea was the deconstruction of Chosen One narratives using Episode 2 as the main talking point. Yet, as I chipped away at that general theme, it gradually evolved into other topics I wanted to gush about, that I felt were worth discussing or analyzing. And it grew from talking about just one theme to talking about many. From one episode to 19. From a simple 20-minute video idea to what would eventually spiral into a seven-hour trilogy. Throughout the month of September 2020, as my life was stuck in immigration limbo thanks to the... events of that year, I poured nearly all of my energy into this dumb little passion project for want of giving me... something to do, as I and the rest of the world slowly slipped into madness. Never expecting much to come from it given how minuscule my channel was. Even saying at one point in a personal discord I was putting in a lot of effort into something that probably wouldn't crack over a hundred views at most. Life has a funny way of pulling the rug out from under you sometimes. And this silly video I made with stupid jokes and even worse audio quality steadily climbed and climbed, far beyond anything I was expecting. The tiny channel I had reappropriated for a lark, after seeing a really shoddy independent Christian movie I had a fifth-hand association with, don't watch that video by the way, it's bad, had expanded from a handful of subscribers to a hundred, to five hundred, to a thousand, five thousand, ten thousand. I don't mean to take the focus away from Owl House by babbling on about my flash-in-the-pan success story, for lack of a better term. It's just that, to see a show I was so passionate about, to the point of putting myself out there with an hour-long video essay, finally reach its conclusion. And I have to say goodbye to all the characters and themes I've loved dissecting so much. I guess that's another reason why I feel so conflicted about it, and why it's taken me so long to hash out these feelings in written and video form. I make no claim of being the number one Owl House fan or anything. There are plenty more dedicated channels and people than I who have given every ounce of their being into talking about this show. Be that through traditional video essays, in-depth analysis, silly and heartfelt reactions, fan art, fan fiction, fan animation and recordings, interviews with the cast and crew, original songs, 
and the wonderfully stupid memes. To be even a small part of that outpouring of love and dedication for a show filled with all kinds of talented people working in front of and behind the microphone or canvas. To shed a light on those who felt ignored or ostracized by their peers or elders. If nothing else I ever make for this channel gets even a fraction of the attention these Owl House videos have received, I think I can still be satisfied with that. I truly owe a lot more to this show than I really gave it credit for. Perhaps enough to say without a trace of irony or sensationalism, that it kind of changed my life. Maybe not to an extreme extent, but whenever I'm feeling down about my talents as a writer or video essayist, all I have to do to make myself feel even a little better is take a look at some of the comments in either of the last two Owl House videos I've made. All the people who say they got something from them, either a laugh or perspective or even affirmation. I may not reply or heart all of them, but they all mean a great deal to me. That anyone cared enough to watch three or even one hour of a rando talking about some cartoon made for an audience way younger than him. To get at least one comment saying they watched the whole thing despite not even knowing anything about the show at the time. It feels conceited or self-aggrandizing to talk about it like this, but it means a lot to me. And I'm not sure where my path will lead me once I've released this video, on YouTube or otherwise. But I know that whenever I'm feeling nostalgic for that strange yet affirming time when I too felt seen and affirmed by dozens upon hundreds upon thousands of people, I can always come back to the Owl House. And while I may not like Disney's whole deal, I can begrudgingly accept that they were the ones who gave Dana Terrace and her crew this chance to tell their story in the first place. And the show may not have ended up as it did under another network's supervision. So... Well, good job, Disney. No matter how you slice it, though, it's truly the Owl crew who deserve all the praise for everything they did with the show, how hard they fought for it, and for how excellent the quality of Season 3 remained despite everything that stood against them. Does that mean it's perfect? No, of course not. And the production troubles the crew faced doesn't mean these episodes are above any criticism. But for what they were given and what they had to endure, I feel no shame in calling Season 3 nothing less than an absolute triumph. They did it. They steered their ship through a brutal storm and gave us all an ending that still inspired hope and confidence in the future. For this, I unfortunately have nothing to give besides an earnest and heartfelt thanks. To them, and to every fan who watched or listened to me gush about their efforts in this video and the rest, thank you all, from one weirdo to another. Can we have another montage? Yeah! Montage activate! Not so fast, Montage! Oh no! It's my evil nemesis and credits, man! Quickly, let's all get out of here before he- I don't fit in at all. You don't fit in here. If I say, we could not fit in together. Us weirdos have to stick together, you know? A human on the boiling aisles! How did you get here? What are you doing here? Gus? Nickname? Human nickname? Gus? Call me Wow Gus? I'm not a witch, but I'm training hard to be one. Maybe you aren't a bully. I haven't exactly been the friendliest witch either. I'll think on that. Eventually go home, and now you're spending more time at school. I just want to be around you. I love you, Ida. I love you too, you know. Every friendship comes with its ups and downs, right, best friend? I'm not commenting on that. 
hoots it for. <laughs> You're not my friend. You're just the Golden Guard. My name is Hunter. Don't worry. You always have a way of sneaking into people's hearts. Don't give up so easily. They probably need you more than you realize. Crank or not, she's the one who raised me, which is why I am legally changing my name to King Clawthorn! <laughs> Surprise, Ida! Now we're connected for life and there's nothing you can do about it! Everything is so crazy right now, and I have no idea what my future holds, but it would be so cool if you were a part of that. Luce, I'm so happy I had you as a big sister. My biggest mistake was trying to protect you by changing this beautiful, good witch into something she wasn't. People are complex, and sometimes they just need a little kindness and forgiveness. Ida, King, thank you for everything. Right back at you, Kiddo. Weirdos? Weirdos. Weirdos.